Hey there, and welcome to Houdini for the New Artist. My name is Tyler Bay, and in this course, I'm going to show you how to get started with Houdini. But before we get there, I have a question for you. Have you ever done any kind of CGI or 3D production before? Have you ever tried out Blender or Maya or Unreal, anything like that? If you haven't, then check out my other video, What is CGI, before watching this one. In that video, we talk about CGI in general, what it is, what we're trying to accomplish, what a render is, what textures are, where all of this comes from. And by watching that video, it's going to make this video a lot more easy to understand. Let's kick things off at the very beginning with installing Houdini. If you go to sideeffects.com, get, download, this is where you can download the Houdini launcher. So install that. I'm going to press the Windows key on my keyboard, type in Houdini Launcher, press enter, and this is where we can manage all the different installs of Houdini that live on our computer. So if I want to install Houdini, update it, change the version, all of that can be done right here. Let's go to this Get, Buy, and we'll see that Houdini offers many different types of Houdini for sale. The one that you probably want is Houdini Apprentice, which is for free. This is great for learning, it's great for understanding how the program works, but it does come with some limitations. More on that here in a second. The other ones that you might want to consider is Houdini Indie, Houdini Artist, or potentially Houdini Education. If you ever decide to sign up for CG Forge and go with the yearly option, I can offer you guys this education price. Uh, or if you go to university or you do other online schools, this might allow you to get Houdini for $75, which is basically the indie version, uh, but this is designed for education and developing your demo reel. But if you wanna really compare the details, go up here to compare, and this really lets you know what the different limitations are depending on the version of Houdini. Let's go back to the Houdini launcher. And if you don't have Houdini installed, press this plus icon and go with the production build right here. Once that's done, we can then just go over here and press launch. For this course, I'll be going with the Houdini 20 beta. You guys ought to have the full version of Houdini 20. And even though our versions of Houdini don't match, everything in this course should be something that you can follow if you're using a later version of Houdini. It doesn't matter if you're on Houdini 25 in the future, this should still be applicable because not everything changes with each version of Houdini. So just keep that in mind as we go forward. Since we're on the topic of getting set up and everything, it's also really important to think about hardware specs. So what kind of computer do you need to run Houdini? Well, let's start by going up to support and go to system requirements. At a very bare minimum, you should be able to meet these requirements. So using Windows, at least having Windows 8 or beyond is good. Windows 7 is not supported. Same goes for everything they mentioned here with Mac and Linux. Memory, this is your RAM. Four gigabytes is required. 12 gigabytes or higher is recommended with 64 gigabytes strongly recommended for fluid simulations. I personally would recommend having more. I would say minimum of 32 and up to about 128 if you want to do fluid simulations. Uh, so keep that in mind. These are minimums right here. This goes up much higher, <laughs> but you don't need to have a crazy amount of memory either. Um, disk space, at least four gigabytes required for installation. One thing I find people overlook is having a solid state drive. You want to install Houdini on a solid state drive and you also want to cache out files onto a solid state drive. So what I'm talking about here is if we go to newegg.com, this is a PC component store and what I'm talking about is if we go to components and storage, SSDs, internal SSD, this is basically like a, a hard drive. This is where you save your files to. 
And the nice thing about having a M2 SSD, which is what we see right here, is that it's really fast at writing and reading these files. And so Houdini is going to be writing and reading lots of files, depending on what you're doing. And for that reason, you want to have at least two terabytes of storage within a SSD drive on your computer. Uh, if you don't have an SSD and it's just a spinning hard drive, then you're going to find that Houdini will be very slow for you. And uh, you wanna make sure that you have one of these right here. The other recommendations I have is if we go to cpubenchmark.net and we go to the high-end CPUs, try to make sure you have a CPU that's within this high-end list. It goes on for quite a long time, but as long as you're on this list, it should be good enough to get you going with Houdini. The CPU here is basically how fast the brain is for your computer. <laughs> That's one way of thinking about it. How quickly can it think about stuff and solve problems? So if we go to this PC and I say properties, my processor right here is the AMD Ryzen Threadripper 1950X. So what I'll say is control F, keyword search 1950X, and boom, there we are. This is a score for how fast that brain is or how fast my computer can solve problems. Your graphics card is also important and we have video card benchmarks up here. In Houdini, you can use your video card to calculate simulations, so you can use it as a brain, but this particular brain is specialized in things like your viewport or showing things on your screen. That's, again, kind of a general way of thinking about it. What I would say for graphics cards is if you get something that is a 1080 or better, then you'll be good to go. I actually am using a GeForce GTX 1080 right here, which has a score of 15,000. So if you have any of these graphics cards that's a 1080 or above, that would be ideal. Even if you have something a little bit slower, you can still make that work. But something around here at the top end of this chart is going to be ideal. Let's talk about the main sections of the Houdini interface now. In the middle here, we have our scene view. This is where all the 3D stuff lives in our scene. So all the models and textures and stuff that we want in 3D is going to be shown right here. At the bottom right, we also have the network view. We have the parameter view up top, the shelf, and the timeline. These are the main sections to learn at first with the interface. The other thing that's really good to know about Houdini is that everything you do is done by creating notes. Let me show you what I mean. Let's say that I want to create a sphere in our 3D scene. I'm going to hover my mouse over the network view, which is the bottom right. I'll press tab on my keyboard and I'll type in sphere. If I press enter, that will select whatever was highlighted. I press enter again, that will make this node. And as we can see, a sphere is now part of our scene. Now let's say I want a cube. Press tab. As your mouse is hovering over the network view, it needs to be over the network view. Say box, that's highlighted, enter, and then enter again. Boom, we have a box. And it's actually being covered by this sphere right now. So if I wanted to move this box, what I can do is I can go to the very top here, this little parameters section, and I can change these box settings so that let's say we move this in the X direction. So I'll take this value of zero and I'll say that is now a value of two. And as you can see, the properties for this node or the parameters for that node now have changed what we have in our scene and in our viewport. Let's say that we want to frame these objects now in our scene so that we can see them both. Hold down Alt, 
middle mouse is going to pan, right mouse is going to zoom, and left mouse is going to tumble. And so whenever you want to move around, just use the Alt key and start clicking until you get where you need to go. <laughs> so in this case, I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Again, that's right mouse, left mouse, tumble around, middle mouse, pan, and now we can see things in our scene much more easily. We can also navigate in this network pane by holding down middle mouse to pan and right mouse to zoom. You don't need to hold down alt if you're in this network view, although you certainly can and it doesn't break anything. But uh, again, middle mouse pans, right zooms, you can just drag these notes to organize them however you want. And we can even click on their names to name them something else like Superbox or whatever it is. So you just left mouse click, type it out, press enter, there you go. Also one thing to know is that on these nodes we have these little colored things. And the first one to know about is the blue eye icon. So if you click this, uh oh, what happened? <laughs> the box is gone. That controls whether or not things are hidden or visible in your scene. So we can turn that on, we can turn it off. There you go. Also keep in mind that we don't have to make boring old spheres and boxes. We can also create test geometry in Houdini. So keyword test, and look at that. Houdini found that keyword test, and it gave us all the results for nodes with that keyword test in it. Better yet, I can do a keyword of, let's say, crack. And look at that, it found that part of the word as well. So one of the questions that people have often in Houdini when they're starting is, how do I know where to go in figuring out the nodes I need? Or like, how do I know these names? And a lot of times it comes down to knowing some kind of keyword to look for. Because Houdini is really intelligent in taking a keyword that you give it and finding nodes that relate to that keyword. So in this case we have crag, or if I said test geometry, it pulls it up. But that's also going to be true for other operations in the future where you want to do something in Houdini. And if you're not sure what the node is, you might be able to guess a keyword and find what you need by doing it that way. Here's another thing that trips up beginners at first. Let's say that I have the sphere highlighted and I'm thinking to myself, okay, I wanna move crag over to the right. And I go up here and I say, all right, crag, go to the right. So point one and nothing happens. Why is that? Well, it's because right now we have our sphere selected and these parameters follow whatever you have highlighted down here. So just be careful about that. Whenever you want to change the setting of something, make sure it's highlighted first. That will load that node's parameters and now this is actually going to work as you might expect it to. So just keep that in mind. The other thing that's good to know about this uh, interface here is that if you want to change these values, you don't always have to type that out. You can hold down middle mouse button and it gives you these brackets of how you want to change the value. So I'll go ahead and highlight this 0 0.01 and as soon as that's highlighted, this is all holding middle mouse by the way, go left and right. And that gives us a really nice convenient way of changing some of these parameter values. Or you can type it, either way. At the bottom of the interface, we have our timeline. And if you watch the What is CGI video, then you'll know that animation is just this illusion where we have lots of pictures that flash before our eyes really quickly. And so if I press play here, we can see that we have animation with Crack. And this is how we measure that animation over time. Now at first you'll notice that this is going pretty fast. And one thing you need to keep in mind with Houdini is that you need to go down to this bottom left little clock icon and turn this on for it to actually play 
24 frames per second, which is the default speed of how many images flash before your eyes every single second. So now when I press play, this is the actual speed of that animation. Before, it was trying to play it as quickly as possible, but now this is playing 24 frames per second, and this is a good way of seeing what the animation is actually doing. If you want to scrub across this timeline, in other words, go frame by frame, press the left and right arrow keys. As you can see, this will go forward in time, one frame at a time. Also, for additional animation options, go to the very bottom left, and this will bring up the global animation options. As a beginner, I wouldn't worry too much about those options, but if you are looking for animation options in the future, it's down there at the bottom left. We'll talk more about animation in the future, but for right now, know that all that stuff lives down there. Let's move on to the shelf though. Up here lives a lot of different presets for things that you might want to do in your scene. So let me give you a cool example of that. Let's say I want to go to the, oh, I don't know, the pyro effects tab. And I wanna choose this preset of sparse billowy smoke. I can just click that. As soon as that happens, we'll notice that at the top left, we've engaged this sparse billowy smoke. We also have some instructions at the very bottom. It says, select location of the smokestack. So it's asking us to do something here to tell the tool, tell the shelf tool what to do. So I'll click right here. And as soon as I do that, at the very bottom, you might've seen that it was thinking about stuff and then it created a bunch of nodes here. Now at first this might be a little bit frightening because if we try to zoom out here, uh-oh, we lost all of our other nodes. Where'd they go? But take a look at this path right here. This acts much like a folder path does. So if I just had like a folder, let's say we have this project that I, I'm working on right now, this Houdini for the New Artist project, this path up here tells me where all the different folders are, right? Well, it's the same exact thing right here. If we go back to this object level and I just left click that, you'll notice that, oh good, there's crag and there's our box and our sphere. We're back to where we were before. But now it created a couple of other nodes like this billowy smoke and this billowy smoke simulation. So that means these nodes often act as folders for other nodes. If I highlight this billowy smoke, I double click it, it's like going inside of a folder and we're browsing inside of this node. So a lot of times Houdini is just a bunch of nodes within nodes within nodes. And depending on what you're trying to do, everything is organized based on this whole structure of things existing within other things. So we go into this billowy smoke. We'll notice that we have a bunch of nodes here and these nodes are actually going to control the different properties of that smoke. If we go back to the object level, this OBJ right here, and I try to adjust this, we can adjust the position, but that's all we have as far as these parameters go. As a matter of fact, all of these object level nodes are basically just folders that you can move around in your scene. Even our sphere right here, it's just a folder. And if we double click that, inside lives the node that actually makes the sphere. So there's the folder. It's like having a bucket, but inside that bucket lives the thing that actually made something in our scene. And this has all the specific properties you might want to change for whatever it is. So even though this billowy smoke is really cool, I want to save the topic of simulations for another time. So in order to delete these nodes, you can just highlight them and press delete. Easy as that. And what's also really cool is uh, control Z does undo, by the way. So that'll bring us back. Uh, but what's also cool is that if I ever wanted to make a copy of something, 
like let's say I want another crag here. You can hold down Alt and left mouse drag to copy whatever node you want. In this case, I copied an entire folder of all the stuff that makes up crag and I brought it over here. So this is really cool because let's say you had a bunch of models or shaders or you want to duplicate things. It's as easy as just, you know, holding down Alt and dragging things around. These nodes have a really cool way of organizing your scene. And um, yeah, that's what's really cool. Also, very important, everyone needs to know this. Highlight these nodes, press C, and this allows you to color things. So color coding is also possible. So I want to make our billowy smoke nodes red as an example, and maybe our geometry over here green. So you highlight that stuff, that's green, press C, and that removes our color palettes, and uh, there you go, easy as that. Any options that are related to this network view can be found right here. So we can add nodes, we can change how things are laid out, and we can also see the hotkeys that are associated on the right-hand side of that selection. So layout all is hotkey L. I'm going to hover my mouse over this, and now when I use the hotkey L, there you go. It laid everything out. Keep in mind though, that that hotkey only worked when my mouse was hovering over that pane. So if I was over the viewport and let's say I just pressed L, nothing happens. If I'm over here, it works. Just keep that in mind. Hotkeys depend on wherever your mouse is hovering over. And if you want to learn those hotkeys, one intuitive way of doing so is just by taking a look at these little grayed out hints right here. There's a couple more things I wanna talk about before we jump into the Chameleon project. So hang in there. Uh, one other thing is if let's say I want to use viewport hotkeys. So I'm, my mouse is over here and let's say I press S for select. We can see that this tool is now active. I can select stuff like let's say our sphere and then I can use the hotkey T to transform that or to move that thing around. We can see that that is shown up here. We can also see on the left hand side that this tool is highlighted. So that's move T. We can see the hotkey right there as well. This is going to be rotate R and we have E for a scale. So again, those hotkeys S for select T for transform or move. R for rotate, and E for a scale. And this allows you to move things around just by dragging some handles in your viewport. Another way to select things is just by going over to our node network and highlighting, let's say, our box. If I have that, I press T for transform. That's our move tool. I can move this over, maybe E for a scale, bring it up, and hold down Alt to take a look at this. One question you might have is, how do I highlight the face of this polygon? Or, you know, if I press S for select, it grabs the whole object, but it's not actually grabbing the face. And if we go up here, there's really no options for selecting the faces of something. Uh, this is a common area of confusion. The reason why we can't select the faces on this box is because right now we're on this object level. And so all of the move settings and all of these tool settings that we see up here at the top relate to things you might want to do if you're moving these networks around, these folders around. But as soon as I dive into that folder, or as soon as I dive into that network, these options now change. We are now modifying the geometry more directly because we're inside of that folder. So now I can go up here and I can say, all right, select the primitives, which is going to be the faces. And now I can actually select this guy, press E for a scale. You'll notice that it automatically made a node over here because I'm doing something to my scene. And now I can just go crazy by using these viewport controls 
which ultimately are just changing these settings over here. So as I scale this up and down, I'm just changing those numbers that live on that node. And so again, everything you do in Houdini is represented by nodes. And if you do something here in the viewport, it might automatically create nodes for you, right? And if you want to change things, you might need to pay attention to where you are in this file path directory, right? Another thing that's really interesting to notice is that while I'm inside this box network right here, when I press tab, I have a bunch of different nodes that I can't find if I was here on the object level. So I press tab again, these nodes are completely different than what I had inside here. So whenever you enter into a different zone in the interface that has different nodes, that is considered the various contexts of Houdini. So a context is like a zone. It's an area that has specific nodes with specific tasks in mind. In this case, when we go inside of this box network, we are in what's called SOPS. SOPS stands for Surface Operators. And these nodes relate to the modification of geometry that lives within these networks, that lives within these boxes. So all of these nodes have to, you know, modify some kind of geometry that lives inside of these boxes. If, let's say, I was to hold down left mouse and go to one of these other contexts, like let's say the material context under mat, when I press tab, we have tons of different nodes now available specifically related to the task of creating materials that go onto our objects and define their surface properties. So again, the context is what nodes are available to you, what zone of the interface is currently active. That's a good way of thinking about it. We'll talk more about contexts in the future. It's definitely a very important concept and it gets easier to understand the more you use Houdini. But just know that depending on where you are, you have different nodes, you have different options on these tools right here. And uh, don't let that confuse you as you're going about the interface. Now that we know about the very basics of the interface, Let's start diving into the fun stuff, which is going to be our chameleon project. I'm going to start by highlighting all of this, pressing delete, and starting with the clean slate. As a matter of fact, if you want to bring your camera back to where it was when you first opened Houdini, hold down spacebar, G. There we go, now we're back. And with a fresh scene here, I'm going to start off by saving this file into a new project folder. So whenever you create a new project, I would say go to your desktop and make a new folder. Right click, new, folder, chameleon or chameleon, chameleon. I think that's how you spell it. <laughs> I don't know. English is a little bit weird with the spelling, so I'm pretty sure that's how you do chameleon. Project. You can name that whatever you want. Whatever the project you're doing, just make sure you call it something you recognize. Once we have a new folder, I like creating a few things. So another folder in here, make yourself a geo folder, right click, make yourself a reference folder. This will be where we place reference images or things you download online, stuff like that. And let's create a render folder. This is where our final images will eventually live. So once we have that, I'll go back to Houdini I'll say file, save as, and we're gonna to go to the desktop. I'm gonna find the chameleon project, and I'm going to name this our chameleon project version one. And I like having this naming convention where we have the V1 at the very end. Uh, it's good to keep track of the different versions of your scene and always just version up as you save a new scene file. Also, I'm going to save it right here. So when I say accept, 
and we go back to our chameleon project, the Houdini file that's called the hip file lives right here. And all of the folders which contain information about this project are right here. Make sure that your hip file is right here and is not in a subfolder, okay? There's reasons for that. I'll tell you why later, but take my word for it. This is how you want to set things up. And now we shall browse Sketchfab to find ourselves a model that would work really well. Specifically, I'm going to type in chameleon. And if we scroll down, this is what I want to use. So click on that. And this will allow us to download this entire scene. So this, by the way, was done by Dennis Goddard. And if we scroll down here, this is who made this. It's absolutely fantastic. Definitely check out Dennis's work. And we can just say download 3D model. And it'll give us different file formats to pick from. So in this case, I like using the GLTF. I'll say download. And it's going to ask you where to save this, or at least on my browser, it does that. So we'll go to desktop and I'll save this under our chameleon project. And let's for right now, put this under the reference folder. So we save that. I'll go up here, check out my downloads. So there it is. Right click, going to unzip this. So extract here. And then this will give us all of the files we need to bring this into Houdini. So let's hop on over to Houdini and I'm gonna press tab and say GLTF. See, I didn't even have to know that node existed. I just needed to know the keyword GLTF and boom, we're good to go. So as soon as I do that, it says file name, We'll click on this little icon. That's how you browse for files. And we'll notice that it brought us over to this thing that says dollar hip. And this is an area of confusion, by the way, uh, for beginners. This dollar hip is a shorthand version or a shorthand way of saying, find the location of the scene file and then go from there, right? So whenever you see dollar hip, that's saying, take where you saved your scene file and now go to one of these folders. So it's a very easy way for browsing things. Uh, anyway, let's go to the ref folder and I'll click on this scene and hit accept. Nothing happens at first because we need to click this button called build scene. And as soon as I do that, don't worry about this little error, just minimize that. We now have the scene and just like that, we have our chameleon. He's looking a little bit funky. So if it looks like this for you, go to the light bulb up here with the X on it and click on that. These options over here give you different settings for the viewport lighting. We'll talk more about lighting later, but this X removes any of that lighting information and it just gives us the colors to preview our surfaces. So there we go. We have our little chameleon guy with the butterfly. If you want to get rid of this scene grid, go up to the top right, click that. Sometimes it's kind of annoying to have that there. And if we double click inside of this GLTF hierarchy, you can see how this was built. We have these geometry networks. We dive inside of here, and this actually contains the polygons and all the stuff that makes up this scene. So there's some of the flowers, here's some branches, and so on and so forth. So I'm not sure how this is organized. It looks to be organized in a very strange way. So what we'll do is this. Instead of relying on the way that this GLTF organized all this, I'm going to go back to the object level and I'm going to make a new geometry network that's outside of all of this. So I'll press tab, type in geo, enter, enter, and I'm going to call this our chameleon build. Double click in here. There's nothing in this yet, but to import the information, 
from our GLTF hierarchy, I'm going to use a node called the object merge. So the object merge will take stuff from other networks and import it into this current network, which is the chameleon build. So when I go to the object up here and I browse for it by clicking on this button, I can go select our GLTF hierarchy and hit accept. As soon as I do that, you'll notice that, well, nothing really happens here. It's kind of ghosted out. And, you know, if I turn this off, we still don't have anything in this network. So what's the deal? Well, you might also notice if we zoom in, we have this little exclamation point. That looks kind of suspicious, right? And if I hover over this node and I click on this exclamation point, this will give us an error message. So this says right now, invalid SOP specified. And remember, we know what SOPs is. SOPs is this area inside of a network. So based on this error message, we can actually understand what it's telling us. It says, well, okay, we invalid means that it's not a proper SOP that's been specified for some reason. And that's why nothing is showing up. All right, good to know. Let's exit out of here. And what you need to do is this. When we browse for this object, go ahead and press forward slash, and this will give us a more specific object to pick. So I could go down here and say, I want object four. And remember object four is one of these guys. And now it's actually going to pick up those different networks. And so the reason why it was giving us that error is because we didn't actually select a network. We just selected that, you know, the GLTF thing. However, if I want to just grab everything, I can just highlight this path right here, get rid of object four, and instead I'm going to say star. So shift eight. Whenever you see this little star, that means everything. So grab everything. Press enter. Oh, there he is. <laughs> and now we don't have that error message anymore. We have our chameleon and all is well. Well, actually, I shouldn't speak too quickly because all is almost well here in paradise. If we turn on our GLTF hierarchy, uh oh, this is a lot smaller than what we have in our chameleon build. To fix this, it's very simple. Let's just go inside of our chameleon build and you'll say transform into this object. Without getting too complicated, what that says is take all of these different things that scale down. These things are called nulls and these nulls can scale things down. It kind of moves things around like we saw before when we moved things around here on these parameters. So. Whenever you have these nulls and they rotate stuff and move stuff around, they are transforms or they are transforming the geometry. They're scaling it, rotating, etc. So by saying here, transform into this object, that means apply the nulls to what we have right here. Don't let that get you too confused, but there you go. Now I'm sure right about now, some of you are saying, oh my gosh, how am I going to understand all of these different parameters and all of these different notes. This is gonna be crazy. Well, let me show you something. Even if you had no idea what a transform was and you had no idea how to fix this problem, you could just intuitively figure this out by pressing a bunch of buttons and seeing what happened. <laughs> I'm not joking, watch this. I'll make a copy of that, again, Alt, left mouse drag. And I'll turn this back to the default, which is the, uh, this right here. Even if I had no idea what any of this meant, I'll just start selecting stuff and see what happens. You know, go crazy with it. I find that for some reason, beginners have a hard time clicking buttons. And the worst case scenario is this. The worst case scenario is that maybe you crash Houdini Probably not, so just save your scene file, no big deal. And if you do mess up some settings for some reason, you can always just delete a node 
and try again. Tab, object merge. You're back to where you were before. And that's an incredible thing with node workflows. Because in other applications, you wouldn't be able to really go back like that. If you checked some of these boxes and then, you know, 30 minutes later, you're on to something else and you made some wrong decisions over here. Um, in other applications, you would have to revert back to an old save file. But in Houdini, because everything's a node, no problem. Make a brand new one. It's no big deal. So that's really cool. And I guess what I'm saying here is don't be afraid to just experiment and try things out, even if you're not sure what all of these settings do right away. Since we're on the topic of figuring stuff out, if you ever want to bring up this node's user documentation, go to the top right with this question mark and press that. This will pop up the documentation for the highlighted node, and that is a great way of also figuring out what these different things do. Now, I'll be honest with you, sometimes the documentation is going to be overwhelming as a beginner. Sometimes you're not gonna understand what this says, but I don't want you to feel like you have to understand everything right away. A lot of times Houdini users just use a node and the only thing they care about is just a couple of things. Like in our case, the object merge, it brings stuff in. We only care about this setting and this transform setting. Everything else doesn't matter and you don't really have to know what it does. But if you are trying to bring something in and there's some kind of functionality that you still need and you're wondering if this node has it, that's a good time to bring up the documentation and start digging through what these different things do. So even though there's a lot of information and even though this might feel overwhelming because there's just a lot of info, just realize that most nodes, you don't need to know everything. It's just a couple parameters and you're good to go. So anyway, let's get back to the fun stuff, shall we? I think our chameleon is ready for the big time. I'm talking about rendering. We want to make a high quality picture of our scene. Well, this is where things get a little bit confusing with Houdini. So allow me to explain. For many years, Houdini used Mantra as its primary render engine. The render engine is the part of the program that creates the image. And even today, many, many nodes in Houdini revolve around Mantra. Parts of the interface are designed with Mantra in mind. And so a lot of stuff is there in Houdini that used this old system. Allow me to quickly show you what it looks like to render with Mantra. To render something out, we need lights, camera, and action. Just remember that. So I'm going to press tab, keyword light, right there. Change this to a grid. That basically makes a square-shaped light. And then we can click this little thing right here to uh, move this around. Or you can use the hotkeys like R for rotate or T for transform. And we can rotate that. Let's turn on our viewport lighting right here so we can actually see this now. Turn up the exposure. There we go. There's our light. Next, camera. Boom, there's a camera. The easiest way to move this around is to go to the top right, select cam one. That's the camera we just made. Click this lock icon and then start moving around. So there we go. That's the angle we want to look at here. As soon as you have that angle, go back to that lock icon, click it again. And as we navigate around, we pop out of that camera. That camera is now set in place. And so lights, camera, go to the render view up here and click render, action. And behold, we have a chameleon. It doesn't look very good right now, but it is an image. <laughs> if we right click this, we can say save frame. And from here, we can save this out as, as a JPEG image or an EXR, whatever image you want onto your hard drive. 
Also, I want to mention something while we're here. If we hold down left mouse and we go to the out context, this area has the mantra node. This is where our render settings are for that mantra render that we have right here. And so this can specify where you want things to save. It specifies the render quality, all kinds of stuff. Uh, but just keep in mind that, that the out context, if you press tab, has a bunch of nodes here for rendering. So again, for Mantra, this is what the process looks like. But with the release of Houdini 18, that entire workflow that I just showed you completely changed. Everything from the creation of the lights, the camera, and how you rendered changed entirely. With Houdini 18, a new render engine called Karma came around. And Karma is different than Mantra in that it requires USD. USD stands for Universal Scene Description, and this is a system developed by Pixar Animation Studios to help multiple artists work together in a collaborative environment. So this USD information is required by Karma in order to work, and because of that, Side Effects developed an entire section of Houdini that is dedicated specifically to the creation and modification of USD information that eventually goes to your render engine to give you an image. So again, just so that we're clear, Chameleon Dude needs to turn into USD. USD then goes to Karma, and then we get our pretty picture. Let me show you how. First things first, you don't make your lights and camera here. Get rid of that. Secondly, we need to go to the stage context. This section of the interface creates USD information that then goes to Karma. However, I would also recommend one more thing. If you are going to be working with USD, you should also go up here to the very top. Right now it says build and then go down to Solaris. So click that. This top menu has different presets for your interface. So if you wanna switch things around, in this case, we want to go to Solaris, and that is this USD area to modify things. So once we're in here, I'm going to say Tab, and I'll say Scene Import. And what this scene import does is it takes everything on the object level and it converts it into USD information. So under this objects section, I'm going to browse for our chameleon build, say accept pattern, and then there we go. Now we have our chameleon again. So there's our chameleon. He came with this weird cross. He's not religious, I swear, but I don't know why he did that. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, is that in the process of converting to USD, sometimes you're going to get some weird artifacts or some weird looking things in your scene. This cross is one of those things. So allow me to move my video picture up here for a moment. At the bottom left, we have this scene graph path, and this is like an outline of our scene. All this stuff here is USD and how that USD is organized. So if I click on this plus icon, we can scroll down and we have this thing called X form. And these X forms are creating the weird stuff we don't want to see. So just click on this power icon and turn all of that X form information off. There we go. That turned off our little cross section thingy. Now that we have that, we want, again, lights, camera, action. So, light. We're gonna set that up. And we're gonna go here to the type and we can set this to a rectangle. So, rectangle, again, move this around. We go to the left over here. We have our same selection tools that we're used to. Go like that. Change this uh, lighting to be high quality lighting right there. And then I'm gonna move this around, take up the exposure like we did before, and there we go. 
I can create another camera here as well. Or if I want to take my current view and make a camera based on my current view, hold down control and click on this camera icon up here on the shelf. That creates a camera node based on where my current camera is. And when the lock's on, we're going to move that. When the lock's off, it's going to set the camera where it needs to be. So there you go. You can either create a camera node, node down here and do what we did last time, or you can say control click the camera up here at the shelf. Once we have that, let's look through our camera again. So top right, camera one. Then we can go to this drop down and select Karma XPU. This is going to start rendering now in our viewport. So unlike Mantra, instead of using the render view to preview your image, you can use your viewport right here. To pause this, click on this drop down and say pause render. Then when you're ready to actually save this out into your hard drive, press tab, type in karma, and we can just connect the nodes right there. So with the, with these Karma settings, this is the render settings that controls the quality, the image resolution, stuff like that. And when you're ready to actually save the image to your hard drive, you then select this node, this USD render ROP, and this actually saves out the final image. So as we can see, the Karma workflow is a lot more complicated than the Mantra workflow. And as a beginner, it's not ideal. When Houdini 18 came out, it created an absolute mess in the interface. There's stuff that says render view that doesn't actually render Karma. There's nodes all over the place that may or may not be relevant to Karma stuff versus Mantra. And so as a beginner, these kind of things are frustrating. Now on the plus side, when you become more experienced as an artist and when you work at other studios, the benefits of USD are quite good. It allows a lot of people to work together on the same scene file and there's a lot of good things to come later down the road. But at first, it's a little bit bumpy. And unfortunately, it just is what it is. And so now that you know, that's how you go through this workflow with Karma on a very basic level. So now that we have a very basic setup that works, I want to improve this with our materials and our lights. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to light this, but before I do, I'm going to assign a new shader to our chameleon because when I light stuff, I don't want to be looking at these colors. I just want to be looking at something that's gray to give me a better idea of where the lights are hitting things. So in order to assign a material, I'm going to give us a little bit of room here, press tab, and we want to create a material library node. So we have that and the first thing I'll do is I'll double click this and I'll go inside that network, press tab and type in Karma. As you can see, we have the Karma material builder. So that is going to be a good place to go. Let's rename this, call this our chameleon material and highlight that, press enter to go inside that node or you can double click either way. And now we have the ability to adjust those shader settings. Before we go crazy on that, I want to assign this material to our chameleon. So to test this, set this color to red. And if we assign this properly, our chameleon is going to turn red. So now I'll go back up to the stage, clear out this default assignment, say auto fill materials, that's going to grab the chameleon material network that we have right here. So hence chameleon material right there. And then we need to assign this to our geometry. So if I go here to our scene graph path, I could try dragging this over. If I go to chameleon build, set the visibility here. Uh oh, you might think that would do it, 
but it doesn't because this doesn't turn red. So let's try something else. Let's try dragging over this object zero. See if that turns red. Unfortunately, it doesn't. Let's expand object zero. Try this right here. Drag that over. Aha, that's the thing we need to grab. Now I can go here and I can expand these menus and I can drag it over and heck, I can even hold down control and select a lot of these things and drag that over. But there's actually a easier way to do this. And that's if you drag over this top network here. So this chameleon build and you say forward slash star star. Remember star says grab everything, but star star says grab everything and go inside these drop downs and grab all that stuff too. <laughs> so the, the star is gonna just grab everything most of the time, but if it doesn't grab everything, try star star. There we go. Now everything is red. We've assigned this material properly and I'll go back in here and set this to a gray color so that we can test our lighting. So we'll go here with this middle gray. Okay, awesome. Now that we have that, if we set our visibility here to our key light, we can see where this light is hitting much more clearly. We don't have all that detail and color getting in the way. Let's now think about what we want to do with these lights. I'm going to draw over this, and if you're using Windows, hit the Windows key and type in sketch. Well, not catch, but sketch. There you go. So snip and sketch right there. That'll bring this up, and I always use this window to draw over things when I'm trying to come up with good ideas. So we have our key light. For right now, it's hitting the face. That's good. We also want to have a rim light, so hitting these areas over here that will grab the silhouette or the shape, the outline of our chameleon. So I'll say, here's our rim. And then let's say we have areas like over here near the, the leg that are getting really dark, right? So let's say that we have these areas right here, or we have some of these dark areas. We don't want them getting too dark because then we'll lose detail. And so for these blue areas, that is going to be our fill light. It's kind of hard to see with that blue there, but there we go. Those guys are going to fill in with the even lighting everywhere. This setup right here is called three point lighting. And if you're not used to lighting with photography or videography, what have you, this is a good place to start. So, Again, we have our key, just to recap here. This emphasizes the main face or the thing you want to look at. The rim will pull out the shapes and then the fill is going to make sure we're not losing detail. So that's our goal. Let's do that now inside of Houdini. If you're ever trying to remove a node from its tree, hold down left mouse and then go back and forth real fast. <laughs> So you go left and right really fast. You can just wiggle nodes out like that. And then to make a copy of this, hold down Alt and drag over left mouse. That makes a copy of our lights. Let's call this our rim lights. And then I'll press tab and say dome lights. This is going to be our fill. Now to keep ourselves organized, we have all three lights and I want to merge them together so that they combine with this network over here. Type in merge. That merges everything else. You can just highlight all three, drag that over. Also, there is a hotkey for all this. Grab all of these nodes, hold down Alt, and then grab the little bottom wire right here. That will also create a merge node and then you can plug that in like so. Uh, well, like this, and then you can take this guy and plug it in right there. If you're ever trying to rearrange the order of these wires, you can go up here and click on this up arrow, 
or the hot key for that is shift R. So if you're ever trying to untangle that stuff, there you go, that's how you do it. And there we go, now we're all nice and tidy. Let's start by adjusting our rim light first. Highlight the other lights, so the key and the fill, go to the intensity and set this to zero. By highlighting both, it will do so for both lights, which is really cool. In other applications, you can't really do that, so that's a really cool thing to recognize here. Um, anyway, intensity is zero. Think of this as your on and off switch. This turns the light on or off, so you always want that to be one or zero. And then if you ever want to control how bright it is, the exposure is your dimmer. So it's how bright you want to make it. That's a good way to use these parameters right here. Anyway, we have our rim, and if we go in our viewports, we could see it right there. If you don't have this transform handle, again, you can go back to this little multi-widget tool, and that will bring all of these back. Okay, when we make a rim light, we want to change the type here to distant. And distant is going to create even lighting in basically one direction, but it's a whole wall of that light. So that light doesn't have a shape, it's not a spotlight, it's not a, a box rectangle shape or anything. This is an infinite wall of light heading in one direction. Right now, heading from the top left down to the bottom right. I want to bring out the outline of our chameleon. So let's take this guy, I'll rotate it up first, swing it around, and then have it going, well, let's see, it's backwards with how I'm recording this, but <laughs> from the top right down to the bottom left, that way. So we'll go like that, bring it down, and then we can always just move this over. It doesn't matter where I move this light, the only thing it's grabbing is the rotation. So just keep that in mind. Where you move it doesn't matter, but where you rotate it dictates the direction of that panel or of that wall of light. Okay, so ideally something like that would work, but I can't really tell what's going on here in the viewport. So let's try going to a really high quality version of the, of the lighting. That's this button down here. Let's rotate around here. We still don't see anything. And I'm going to turn up the exposure all the way, turn up the intensity all the way, and we can barely see something beginning to take form. You can always push past these values though. So hold down middle mouse, and I can bring this up even more. And there we go. Now we can actually see what this is doing. So again, I'm trying to get the outline here. I can rotate this a bit, see how the light wraps around him. Let's see if we can do eh, probably around there for now, right? And just to double check this, let's head back to our camera and then do a Karma XPU. So even in XPU, in our final render, we are getting the same light values that we have in our viewport in the render. Okay, cool. Now, one thing you also want to do with this distant light is you want to go down and change this angle. This angle will tell the light to wrap around the object. And so if we turn this angle up, you'll notice that more and more of that light starts wrapping around the object. And again, we can hold down middle mouse over the number and bring this up even further to let's say a value of 25, or you can just type that in, 25. By doing that, it increased our exposure because more of that light is coming back to the camera, and now we can just take this down like so. And let's just do something right around there. Again, go back to Karma XPU, and we can really see in the final render that that light is just wrapping around everything really nicely. And again, those bright zones here, it brings out the shape. I can also rotate this as I'm rendering. And what's really cool is that now I can really see that shape happening right there. We are grazing along the surface. This will bring out detail. And uh, this is exactly what I'm looking for here in my rim for right now. 
Okay, great. Once we like that, let's go over to our key and turn that back on and see what it looks like with the rim and the key. So to restart the render, hold down left mouse and we'll say restart render. Okay, very cool. So there's our rim, there's our key. Again, we are going really dark right here though. We're losing detail and information. So that's when we need this fill light. If we go here and turn on the intensity to one, you'll see that everything just got a bunch of light, which is cool. Now what I want to do is I want to get rid of all of these light handles in our viewport. It's covering everything up. It's kind of hard to see what's happening. So go down to the bottom right and click on this button that will remove those light handles. So don't forget about that because if you ever want to rotate something again, this needs to be on. But that will remove it from your viewport so it's not getting in the way. And if you want to get rid of this uh, transform handle, just click on the selection key right there. And now we can actually see stuff a lot better. All right, once we have all three lights positioned, there's another really cool node that we can use to balance everything out. That's going to be the light mixer node. So we set that up, we plug it in, and you'll notice that this automatically detects our lights. So what I can do is I can drag all three lights in here, I can then go to sliders, and this gives me a really easy way to adjust the, the, the dimmers on all the different lights here. So for our fill, I want to bring this down and let's uh, restart our render right here. So I'll bring this down and as I do so, I want to keep my eye in really dark areas. So like right along the leg right here, that's kind of a dark area. These areas along the vines, those are also some of our darkest areas. And I want to keep going until it actually turns into a black color. This doesn't have to be perfect, but once we reach about this or so, we're in a generally good area for that exposure. I also want to mention one other thing. We have this blue backdrop, right? And if you're ever wondering how to change that, make your mouse hover over the scene view, press D, think D for display. And this brings up additional display options for your viewport in particular. Within these options, we can go to the background tab and we can change this color scheme from light to dark. And now we can really see what that looks like against a black color versus a bright one. So just keep that in mind. We're gonna come back to this menu here later, but I'm going to change that to black for right now because it really impacts how we perceive these light values. We can also zoom in here to get a really good close up of this area. And we could see that these dark areas are not black, but they are kind of close. I'll bring this down just a tad bit more, and uh, there you go. That's what we're after for right now. Okay, great. The next thing I wanna do is really make this thing come alive. And the way I'm gonna do that is by going to our fill lights and including something in this texture field right here. Whenever you have a dome light, Think of a dome, right? A sphere that is over your scene. So imagine we had a sphere here and a sphere was covering everything in here and sending lights in all directions. That's what this dome light is doing. Now, right now it's just sending pure white light in all directions, but it doesn't have to just send white light we can actually assign a texture to that invisible sphere that surrounds our scene. And when we have a texture, it's going to shoot different colors of light depending on the image that we wrap around it. This is gonna be a lot easier to see, so just watch me do it real fast. Start by going to the internet, type in polyhaven.com. Then go up to assets, HDRIs. These images will wrap around that dome 
and send lights in all directions based on these colors. I'll go over to outdoor, that makes sense, and do something that's low contrast for right now. Once we have that, I'll scroll down and there's a good old jungle rainforest scene, so that makes sense for our chameleon. Click that, set it to 8K for right now, and then download this. When we download it, go to our project, our chameleon project, make this textures folder if you haven't done so already, HDRI, and then this is where you download it right here. Now we go back to Houdini, go to our fill lights, texture, browse for that image, hit accept. Now we can see that rainforest trail in all directions. So what we're looking at, again, is a giant sphere that covers our entire scene and we've pasted an image on that sphere. So now when light comes and hits our chameleon, it's gonna create these colors based on the image and it adds a lot of detail. Let's go back to our camera and we'll see this once we go back to Karma XBU. Once you do that, also make sure to go up here and restart the render. All right, cool. So now we have something like that. Now I want to see what this is doing without the key lights and without the rim. So go down to the light mixer. And if we go to the sliders tab, we can solo our lights by clicking this star. So I'm going to solo our fill light. There we go. Better yet, it's hard to see what's going on here because of the HDR and the backdrop. So hover over the backdrop, press D for display. And if you go to the background tab here, we have this display environment lights as background. Environment lights is the same thing as a dome light. So if we turn that off, we're back to our black backdrop where we can see stuff really well. And again, I'm going to zoom in to these areas that are kind of dark and let's just make sure that we're still keeping some of that information in there. I am going to turn this up a little bit, so maybe around here or so, and that looks pretty darn good for right now. All right, so going back here, when I'm done soloing something, I can click on that star again, it brings everything back, and we're good to go. Let's now add more detail to our key light. So just as we were able to apply a texture to our dome light, we could do the same thing with our key. Let's go back here, turn on our light handles again. And this one is a little bit easier to imagine in your head. We have this rectangle or this square, and now all we need to do is find some kind of image to put on top of that. That image is called a gobo. The best way to find these textures is just to Google Light Gobo 3D Texture. If we scroll down here, one of the best results is going to be this one from CG Hacks. This does cost $53 or so, but this comes with everything you'll ever need pretty much when it comes to gobos. And uh, this does make a big difference on the quality of your render, so if you are a professional or you're doing this kind of work a lot, it is worth the $53 to get some high quality gobos. But for right now, we wanna keep this free as much as possible. So the other free thing I found was right here at Reddit where somebody asked this question. And if that goes to our, or this uh, gum road right here, we can find this free pack of gobos. So, I'm going to say zero dollars. Feel free to donate if you would like, but we're gonna go forward with that and use these on our lights. I went ahead and created a gobos folder under the textures, and uh, you can do that too if you'd like. I also have a library that I keep outside of all these projects that has light gobos and any other 3D resources that I use across projects. Uh, so feel free to organize this however you want, but once we have those textures, we can then go to our key light right here and load that in. So for right now, let's just pick gobo number three. If you want to see what those look like, we can go to our textures, gobos, 
and right click view extra large. This gives us an idea of what these are gonna do. So since we're in a jungle, I figure something kind of palm tree-ish makes a lot of sense. Let's go for gobo number nine. So we'll go here, gobo number nine, pick out the TIFF, not the preview. And just to show you what this is really doing, go up to the Karma tab up top, scroll on down, and you'll find that we have this little circle here. Hold down left mouse and say set or create. This allows you to use these settings. And turn on render light geometry. We'll then go to Karma XPU. We'll restart this render. And we should see the texture show up on our gobo. So yeah, there it is. We can see that guy right there. Now, at first, you're not going to see these shadows really happen. It still feels kind of like even lighting across his face. So to make this really show up, you need to go to the very bottom here under this spread parameter. Again, set that and take that spread down to zero to start. Now we can really see those shadows, which is great. Also, we want to scroll up here Go back to the base properties and make our light bigger so that our shadows are bigger as well. We can just turn up that width and we can turn up that height. And this really shows you what's happening here. So let's do that a little bit more until we have something right about there. Let's also go to our camera. So camera one. And now we can see what's happening. Anytime you break up these shadows and you're adding these shapes, you're adding detail. So that's why these gobos are really cool. All right. I think a spread of zero is a little bit too intense, though. It doesn't look very realistic when we have those weird shadows happening. So let's go back to the Karma tab, scroll on down, and I'm going to take the spread to 0.1 to start. Maybe even 0.05 or something like that. Because again, we don't want our shadows being too uh, tight or too sharp. That'll soften things up. You don't need a lot of that, just a little bit. And uh, there we go. We're gonna turn off render light geometry. So that gets rid of that guy. And then go back to our light mixer and turn down our key light as well, since we made that bigger. So if we turn that down, bring it back up a little bit. And there we go. Now we've drastically improved the quality of our lighting through both an HDR and through an interesting key light. Let's also try tinting the color here. If light is going through leaves and forest canopy, it's going to change that color to be kind of greenish. So let's go right here at this green. It's gonna be way crazy, but then we turn down the saturation. So we go kind of like that, add a little bit more yellow and we start getting a more natural looking color as if the light was filtered through the leaves. So there we go, that looks really cool. Now that we've improved our lights, I think it's time to bring back all of our original detail that we had in the shader. But instead of bringing back the old shader, I wanna show you how to make this new shader from scratch. We've already assigned the material standard surface right here with this gray color. But I wanna show you how to bring in texture maps and everything else to make this look the way it should. Start off by taking this material standard surface, going to the base and clicking on it. This will give us different inputs. And those inputs correlate with all the settings we have up here. Press tab. Type in keyword image. So material X image is what you want. And plug that into the base color. We'll call this our diffuse color or diff color. Then let's browse for our hip. Let's go to that GLTF that we originally brought in under this textures folder and select this base color. Uh, this by the way, is just a regular image, so a JPEG image. Hit accept, 
And as soon as we do that, all of our colors are now back, which is great. For now, I won't get into how exactly this is working, but suffice to say, in Houdini for the New Artist 2, we will cover the topic of UVs and how this image makes its way onto our geometry. For now though, just know that we load in the image that the chameleon came with, and then we now have our colors. However, the colors aren't the only thing that we can control on this shader. If we go to our shader, and let's zoom in for a moment so we can really see our chameleon face here. If I play around with these different settings, it's going to change how this looks. So color is grayed out because that's where we're plugging in that. But as soon as I, let's say, turn up the metalness, you'll notice that, well, he looks more like metal. He looks very metallic. And if I go here to the specular and I turn that off, we lost all shininess on the object. He no longer has any highlights or shiny things happening. And so this specularity is basically the reflected light off the surface. And if we go to the roughness, this controls how that shininess looks. If we go to a value of zero, we could see around here, we have highlights that look like glass or look like uh, the surface of water or something. But if I turn up this specular roughness right here, that highlight spreads out across the surface and we no longer have that water looking effect. So I'm not going to go through each one of these parameters. I have an entire course called Shading Theory that is going to cover these topics in much greater detail. But for right now, what I want to do is I want to take our roughness you know, back to the defaults. I think that's 0.2 or what have you. And if I make a copy of this diffuse color node, and I change this to spec roughness, I can use one of the images to control this specular roughness right here. So how much of the sharp highlights we get and how much of the spread out highlights we get. So browse for that image, it's going to be called metallic roughness. And then hit, hit accept. Unfortunately, it does get a bit more complicated here. If we go to that image, let's just browse for it and see what it looks like. So we go to our Chameleon project, we go to Ref, Textures, and we take a look at this texture map or this image. We have all kinds of weird colors happening right now. And to make a long story short, the reason why this texture map looks weird is because there are multiple slider parameters inside of this image. This controls not just one slider, like the roughness here, but it controls multiple sliders, like the roughness, the metalness, and, the, and so a lot of times when people make the textures, they try to include multiple sliders in one image. Anyway, that's common in video games, that's why we see it right here. If we want to see what these different layers look like, hit tab, let's browse under Material X, go to Shader, and we want Material X Surface Unlit. So this removes all lighting information and it shows us exactly what the texture map looks like. So now when I plug this into our emission color, and then I plug that into our surface. This shows us what that texture map looks like when it's applied to the surface, again, without any of our lighting information there. So there we go, we have that. There's one more thing we need to do now though, to access only the specular roughness slider, right? Press tab again. Keyword is vector. So material X separate vector three. And again, I'm going to explain this much better when we get to Houdini for the new artist too, about what a vector is, what floats are, you know. Don't worry if this doesn't make total sense yet, but just follow me for now. When we take this out X, we see a black and white signal. 
This out X is basically the red channel. Out Y is going to be the green channel, and that'll give us a different signal. And then out Z is going to be the blue channel. The combination of red, green, and blue makes up any image. So this is just a clever way of making multiple sliders out of red, green, and blue. That's why we have different things here. So with that all being said, let's take a look at our green channel. And this is going to work quite well, I think, for our roughness. So let's go over to specular roughness and plug that in. The other thing we want to do is go to our material X image and change this signature here to vector three. Again, I will explain this later. So just hang in there with me for a moment. Vector three, there we go. That's going to specular roughness. Let's now replace our unlit material with our lit material and see what that signal is doing. There we go. Now we have our highlights and they spread out, but in certain areas they do become uh, stronger. So there we go, there's the roughness. Let's go back to our unlit shader again and find the metallic setting. So if we go to out Z and we set that to our emission color here, we can see what that signal is doing. And this is going to work well for how metal or how metallic things look. Keep in mind that for the areas that are white, it's kind of like going to our shader here and turning up the metalness to one. Or for areas that are black, it's like taking that metalness slider down to zero. So by using these texture maps, we can get different values across the surface. All right, so with that there, Let's now plug our main shader to the outputs, and there we go. Now we have that set up. There are two more maps to load in, so let's just do that. Make a copy of our specular roughness here, and these other maps are a bit more straightforward, especially the emissive here. So there's our emissive. Let's set this out to our flat shader or our unlit shader. This lets us know what that image looks like. So it looks like that. There is an emission setting right here. So that will go to our emission color. Makes sense. Let's also name this emission. And for each map that you do, make the change, plug it in, make sure it all looks good. So there we go. Now I bring it back. Emission is is setting that lights things up. So this kind of acts like a light on his skin. Think of like a light bulb that creates light. So I plugged in that color and now I have to turn on that light by turning this up. And if I go up to a value of one, we start seeing those guys pop up. I can take this higher though. I could say a value of two and that makes them even brighter, which I think looks even cooler. So we go back and look at that. Want to go up higher? You sure can. Emission value of three. There we go. So let's for right now do that emission value of three. I think that's pretty fun. And we're good to go there. Last map, make a copy of that. This is called our normal map. And we'll browse for that. There's our normal. Again, if you want to see what this looks like, go to the flat shader. From the flat shader, go to surface out. And this normal map is going to add a lot of surface detail. Notice how things look bumpy. Notice how we have these weird colors, but we're getting these different indentations along the surface. Well, with that information, we're going to make these indentations happen. So on that normal, if we plug this into the normal inputs under the geometry tab, and we plug that into the surface output, this is going to mess everything up. So yeah, nothing looks right. And that's because whenever you, you use a normal map, press tab, keyword normal, you need to use a material X normal map node before you plug it into that normal input. The reason why is because now we have the control to say how much of this we want. 
So if you want a lot of that detail or not very much, we now have controls for it with this node, which is great. And uh, let's go ahead and set the scale here to negative one because this is backwards by default. If I zoom in here, we have these dents going into the skin. We want them going out. So we'll go in the negative direction with that. Now they're bumping outwards. And I do think that this is a little bit too intense as well. So I'm going to say negative 0.5, take half of that. And that looks a lot better. The further away you get from the surface, the more you can pull off this effect and get away with it. So it looks pretty good from this distance. But if you do get too close, it looks really ugly. So just make sure that you're far enough away from it and then uh, you're all good. So heading on back to the stage, we changed up all these colors. Let's go back to our light mixer and make sure that everything is still what it needs to be. Uh, right now we have our key light soloed. So if we unsolo that, we should see our rim light come back and our fill lights. Our rim light is a bit too intense, so I'll turn that down. And I'll also take our fill light and turn that down as well. So we'll go down on both of those guys. And this looks pretty darn cool at this point. Next on the list, I want to have some kind of backdrop for this black area. You don't ever want to have a solid color back there. And so let's take what we saw from our HDR and have it light up the back right there. And once we do that, I also want to create a shallow depth of field with our camera. So blurring out the background like we're looking at a close up of our chameleon. So in order to create this backdrop based on the colors that our HDR has, Go to the fill lights, hold down alt. I'm going to make a copy. Let's call this our backdrop lights. And I will plug that into the merge. Now here's the deal. I don't want this backdrop light lighting anything in our scene. I just want it giving me colors for this black area. So in order to do that, go to the Karma tab, scroll on down, this right here says render light geometry, set or create, and turn that on. Also, we have contributions at the very top. Set or create, star means contribute to everything, but we don't want it contributing to everything. Just get rid of that. So now it's not going to light any of our geometry, but it is going to show up as a backdrop. Now, when we restart the render, we should see our HDR show through. And there we go. This is too bright, so let's go to our base properties, set the exposure to zero. And we can always rotate this by going to the transform tab and rotating it, let's say 45 degrees, or you can go in multiples of 45 if you'd like. So 90 or 125, what have you. Let's try this. I want to take down this exposure a bit more. So we want this to go darker until we can see the blue in the sky back here. And then in order to bring the attention back to our chameleon, we want to have that shallow depth of field. So let's go down to our camera, highlight the camera. Then once we do that, pause the render, go to Houdini GL, that's our viewport. And then I'm going to hop out of that camera here for a moment. With the camera selected down here, go to this multi-widget tool. And that will create another handle over here, which is where our camera is going to focus. So if I move that back until we're just along the chameleon's face, everything else that's away from that spot is going to blur out. So let's look back through our camera again. And while we're here, let's actually zoom in a little bit because we're adjusting this. So let's, uh, let's go maybe right about there. And again, make sure that this is set so that this little dot is right where the chameleon's face is. And then once we have that, we'll go to the sampling tab and under the f-stop right here, Set this to 0.1, something really small for right now. 
Let's look through our camera. Go to Karma XPU. Restart the render. And watch as magic unfolds before our eyes. This is going to look great here in a second. Look at that. We're finally starting to get somewhere cool. <laughs> Now, at point one, this is extra intense, but the reason why I did that is because I want to make sure our focus is in the right spot. So, pause this again. I'm going to adjust, again, where this is focusing by just dialing this in even more. So, probably right about there is what I want. Again, look through the camera, Karma XPU, restart, and I want to be able to see his face, his eyes in particular. So when I'm setting that focus spot, the eyes need to be visible just like that. Okay, great. We can go this aggressively with it if we want, but I'm going to go a bit less aggressive. Let's try 0.5. And there we go. Now we have that going on. Let's go back to our backdrop lights. Go to transform and rotate this until we have a, a blurry backdrop that we like. So let's just say for right now, 190. But I like this probably right here. Okay, awesome. So now that we have that, we can always tint this light differently if we want to. So if I want to make the backdrop purple, as an example, you can just add in some purple and it tints that color. We can take the exposure down if we'd like. The more you take this down, the more the focus is going to be on the chameleon because we have contrast, brights and darks next to each other. But don't go so dark that everything turns black. Just kind of hover above the blacks in the darkest areas. And that's going to be a good spot to be in. From here, I would suggest having fun and just playing around with the different light angles, the different exposures. Keep going until you look at this and you think, yep, Everything's dialed in. I like everything that's happening. So uh, yeah, like I said, have fun with it before moving on to this next section. So now that we have an awesome render happening with our chameleon, I want to improve that by adding a few more things. And whenever I try to add something to a project, I always like drawing over a test render if I can. It really helps to visualize what we're trying to do. It helps us come up with a strategy of what needs to happen in order for an effect to come together. So let's do just that. To make a test render, go to the Karma Render Settings, say XPU, I have 512 path trace samples. And what that means is that this is going to make a very high quality image because each pixel goes through 512 calculations to figure out what the accurate color should be. Uh, more on path trace samples and these settings later, but at 512, this will give us a very high quality render. So there we go, 512, then make sure that you're looking through the camera and then go to Karma XPU. And after a couple minutes, we have this. To save this image, go to the bottom left. If you hover over this button, the tooltip will pop up and it says save current renderer image. So we're going to press that. And then I've gone to our dollar hip. That's where we saved our scene file, render. And I made a folder here called test renders. If you haven't made that folder yet, say new folder, test renders. Then I called this our chameleon test render v2 dot jpg this dot jpg says what kind of file i want to save in this case i want to save a jpeg image a jpeg image is if you don't know is a very standard image format that most things can read so for a test render a jpeg makes perfect sense anyway we save that out and when we go to browse for this guy let me go to the render folder we should have this. Awesome. So now that we have this test render, I want to draw over this so that we can sketch out some ideas. And once we have this, we can start brainstorming what comes next. One thing I want to do 
is throw in a dolly zoom effect, or it's also called a vertigo effect. What this does is it zooms into the character's face by bringing the camera physically away from the subject while at the same time zooming in. So imagine physically taking a camera, moving it away from the face, but at the same time you're zooming in with the lens. That's what creates this dolly zoom effect. So check it out. It looks like this. What it really does is it distorts the backdrop. So by zooming in with the camera lens, we're able to manipulate the backdrop and it creates this trippy zoom-like effect. If we did that for our chameleon, specifically, we zoomed into this area where all the action is, it would make up for a really cool, trippy looking effect. So that's gonna be one thing I want to do. Another thing that I want to do is I want to have some floating particulate matter, some spheres or some kind of dust in the air. And I want to have a lot of this dust here floating in the air, just in random directions. So we have these things, they're floating around, and some of these things are going to be caught in the depth of field, and some of these things will be near our butterfly and near our chameleon. We already talked about how the dolly zoom works. All we need to do is animate our camera away from the subject while we zoom in, and that'll give us that effect. But for these particles, we need to start thinking about how we can actually do this. So what I would suggest doing is we want to fill this scene with a bunch of points. Points are just locations in space. And I'll talk a little bit more about this when we go to make these points. But all these points do is represent a location in X, Y, and Z. Now, if I take these locations, if I take these points, and I attach geometry to those points, so let's say I had a cube, right? Let's just pretend that we have a cube here. And I'll even make it three-dimensional. <laughs> We have a cube, we can attach it to these positions. Then all we have to do is move these positions around and then that will move these cubes around or spheres or triangles, whatever we want to put onto those points. So that's going to be the main idea. Uh, the other cool thing about this is we can control other things besides the position on these points. I can control things like the color. So if I told these points that they should be blue in color, I can then take that information and tell our cube to be blue as well. I can also use an attribute called P scale, and I'll talk more about attributes here in a moment, but I can use some kind of value to say how big or small I want this cube to be. And I can randomize that size for every single point. So there's all kinds of cool things we can do, but the general idea here is that we need some points, some locations, we need to attach the geometry, and then we can think about how to manipulate that geometry based on properties we add to these points. Don't worry if you haven't followed along with that 100%, it'll all make sense once we actually do this. We're back now in Houdini and we need to make some new geometry. The stage context or LOPS for layout operations, this whole area is not where you make new geometry. The nodes here won't do it for you. So instead, let's go to the object level and inside these containers is going to bring us to SOPS. And again, SOPS stands for surface operators. So if I press tab, I say geo, Let's call this our particles build. This is where we'll build those particles. And I'll go up to the top here and change this from Solaris back to build. This will bring us back to our default layout that we've had before. Okay, I'll bring my little picture down here as well now. 
By default, we have a really ugly looking chameleon here. So let's go to our viewport lighting and give ourselves that flat color shading. It looks a lot better in this situation. Okay, anyway, once we have that, go inside the particles build and we need to create some points. So if I press tab and I say keyword points, well, these all have to do with points. The question is, how are we going to create these points? Where should the points go? Well, we have a node here called the points from volume. And in order for this to work, we need some kind of geometry to fill with points. So if we just hover our mouse over, geo to fill with points. Okay, so I can create a sphere, let's say, and there's a sphere turn up the uniform scale, maybe bring it over a little bit, and this can be our geometry to fill with points. There we go. Not only did that fill it with points, but it gave us this beautiful abstract piece of point artwork. <laughs> it's really trippy when you, you make these grids of points. Anyway, I'm going to turn up this sphere a bit more. That'll give us some more points. And once we have that, we can go to this jitter scale parameter and turn this up. By doing that, it'll give us more of a randomized cloud of points rather than a neat and orderly grid. So I like this cloud of points. I think that's a lot better. Now I need to attach geometry to this point or to these points. Uh, however, we actually have a lot of points right now. This point separation, if we turn that up, this can reduce the amount of points in our cloud. So let's say about 0.25 or so, 0.23. For right now, this seems like a, a good amount. I'm going to press tab again, keyword sphere. And I want to now attach this sphere to each one of these points. So again, keyword point. If you go down and browse for these different things, you'll find this, which says copy to points. Oh, well, that sounds promising, right? So we'll make this note. We hover over this, it says geometry to copy. There we go. And then target points to copy to. Makes sense. And there we go. So now we, we need to turn down this original sphere scale. And as we do, as you can see, we have a bunch of little points, which is awesome. Can you imagine trying to make each individual sphere and place them like this? It would be a nightmare. So this system works pretty well for what we're trying to do right now. Anyway, that's really cool. Now, if we zoom into these spheres, you'll notice that we have this kind of curved surface happening right here. And I don't want to get into the details too much yet, but when we go to this sphere that we copied over, let's set this over to polygon instead of primitive. Basically put, polygon is going to be what you want to use because this creates geometry that's most commonly recognized in our renders. There's more to be said about this, but for right now, as a beginner, when you make a sphere or a box or a cube, if this is set to primitive, make sure you change it to polygon and your life's gonna be a lot easier until one day you learn about primitives. And I'll teach you that later. But for now, just take my word for it. The next question is how do we move these points around? We don't want them just standing still. A dust particle would be gracefully floating in the air, right? <laughs> so let's take a look back at our points from volume. I'll set the visibility flag right here. Again, that's that little eye icon. And if I highlight this node, so set the visibility and highlight it, now it's going to show us just those points before the sphere was copied over. When we hover over this node, we have this little eye icon. This eye is for information. It gives you information about the geometry that exists at that stage of the network. 
So it shows us that we have 3,251 points. Easy enough. And we also have this point attribute called position. We can also see that when we go up here to the geometry spreadsheet, it's kind of right here below the shelf. This also shows us P for position. And that position is an X, Y, and Z. What's also interesting is that we have these numbers on the left. These numbers are the point IDs. So each one of these points has a unique number, a unique ID. We can see those numbers or those IDs by clicking on this guy right here. And as we zoom in here, we can see we have point number 3038. And so if we want to find point 3038, we can go back to our geo spreadsheets and zoom all the way down until we have 3038 somewhere. And it'll show us the position in X, Y, and Z. The reason why I'm showing you all this is because in Houdini, you'll have the ability to modify this information, to modify these attributes. Let me show you. So we'll turn off our point IDs. I'm going to create something called an attribute noise. When I plug that in and I change my attribute name here to P for position, this will modify the position of each one of our points. It modifies the data that we just saw here in the geo spreadsheet. It's the same data that was described when we went to that little information button right here, this P attribute. So if I go and set my visibility before and after, we can see that it moved those points around. And as I change this amplitude, we can see that even more. And you can kind of see where I'm going with this. If we change this position attribute, it's going to change the location of these points. So now all we have to do is animate this amplitude and that gives us this illusion that these points are floating in midair. There's something really important to recognize here, and that is this. Attributes describe something about geometry in your scene. In this case, the attribute position described where the points were. But we don't just have to have position, we can add additional attributes like color. And if I add color, the viewport's going to recognize, oh, I should turn this little point and make it look red or make it look blue, whatever that color attribute is telling me to do. Or I can take, let's say, an object like a pen. Pretend we had this pen right here in our scene and I assign an attribute called mass to this pen. That can describe how heavy this pen is gonna be. And then let's say I did a simulation where I dropped this pen and had it fall on the ground. Well, that simulation, that solver, can recognize that attribute, mass, that I assigned it, and it will change the behavior of how this falls down. So one more time, just to emphasize this, Attributes describe something about the objects in our scene. In this case, position had numbers, X, Y, Z, that describe the position. But ultimately, you can use other attributes to control behaviors that get used in other nodes, solvers, shaders, the render engine. Ultimately, this information can go anywhere you want to, and it's just used to describe something. Let's now create a new attribute to describe color. Go ahead and press tab. Attribute randomize. We want a random value for each one of these points and we're going to describe color. So CD right here, capital C, lowercase d. That describes color in Houdini. I don't know why they didn't call it color, but <laughs> A capital C, lowercase d, that, that's just how it is in, in Houdini. That's what describes the color of something. So I'll plug that in, and let's actually plug this in after our attribute noise. We set our visibility over here, and lo and behold, we have different colors. It's kind of difficult to see, though, 
So when we actually copy over the spheres, these spheres are going to grab that color information and assign it to the sphere. If we go to our geo spreadsheet, let's highlight these points again before the sphere was copied. Geo spreadsheet, you'll notice that it created this CD. And this time it's CDR, CDG, and CDB. That's red, green, and blue. All colors are a combination of red, green, and blue. So these numbers describe how much red, how much green, and how much blue makes up that color for a specific point. Again, here's our point IDs on the left-hand side. So that's what's happening there with CD. Again, it's just describing the color of something. And lo and behold, we have that on our spheres. Now let's say I want to describe the size of each one of these spheres. Well, on our copy to points, if I highlight this node and I go to this little question mark up here, this will bring up the user documentation. And if you're ever wondering what kind of attributes a node might recognize, that is often described here in the documentation. So as we scroll down, we have this varying the copies section. Again, sounds promising. When you copy or instance geo to points, Houdini looks for specific attributes on the destination points to customize each copy slash instance. For example, you can change the scale of each copy by creating P scale. Aha, there's an attribute name we can use. This attribute on your points. Uh, so it also has this instancing point attributes. Let's click on that. And through a little bit of investigation, now we have a whole list of different attributes that this copy to points is going to recognize. Now this topic of instancing, which is copying things onto points, is actually a rather involved topic. So we're not going to get ourselves into the weeds with how this all works, but you don't have to know everything. All we need to figure out is the scale of something. So here we go, uniform scale, and it's called P scale. Awesome. In order to create this attribute, we can use the attribute randomize again. We can use a attribute noise, or we can try something new. Let's just do an attribute create. An attribute create will just have one value. We're not randomizing anything. We're just setting an attribute to a specific value. We'll plug that in, keyword P scale, right there. And we want to take a look at these other settings as well. Now this is where things get a little bit intimidating. So stay with me here, okay? But the class is asking you, what part of the geometry do you want to associate this information with? I want to associate this with the points. We don't have polygons, we don't have vertices, we really just have floating points. So that default there works just fine. Next, we have this type. And we have all kinds of scary things here. The only things you need to worry about as a beginner is float, integer, vector, or string. Float means that it's going to have a number which has a decimal place. So like 0 0.1 as an example. An integer is a number that does not have decimals. So just solid numbers. A vector is a series of three values like XYZ or RGB that would be considered a vector. It's a collection of three values. Or string is actually where you don't use numbers to describe something, you actually type out words. Like this is a point. You can actually type out words and that is the value for the attribute. So that's all that this is asking you is what kind of information are you describing? In our case, we want a float because we want decimal values we can also say here on our user docs, this says float. So there you go. A little cheat sheet for you right there. Don't worry about all this other mumbo jumbo. The only things we need at this point is to set a default value of 0.1 and then set the value here to 0.1 as well. So set these two things to the same thing. And now we are controlling the size of each one of these points. Again, go to the geo spreadsheet. We can see we have P scale. 
There he is, point one. Since we're going crazy on attributes, I have one more note to show you guys. You are gonna love this. Check it out. It's called the attributes adjust node. And specifically, I'm going to scroll down to the attribute adjust float because our P scale is a float attribute. It has decimal places. Okay, so we have that there. I'm going to bypass this attribute create. So if you want to disable nodes, you can just hover over this and click on this little yellow down arrow thing. That will turn the node off so it doesn't think about it. And now I'm just left with the attribute adjust float to determine P scale. Now by good fortune here, we already have P scale as the attribute name. What's interesting about this node is when you go down to the pattern type. So by default, it's constant, which is just a constant value. We can just make it into, you know, 0.48 or 0.1. Kind of boring, right? What's more interesting is when we take this drop down and we choose something like the radial right here. In order to make this work, make sure that the attribute adjust float is highlighted. Then go over to the left hand side and make sure that this little multi widget thing is highlighted. What this button does is it tells the viewport to look at the currently selected node. In this case, the attribute adjust, and then the viewport controls are going to match whatever that node is trying to do. So now as I drag away from the chameleon, I'm making this circular shape. And as we go away from that chameleon, we can see that this is determining the P scale value based on some kind of circular fall off. Or if I go over here and change the pattern type to line, I can draw out a line and that will allow us to gradually fade from a value of zero to a value of one for P scale, depending on where we draw that line. So let's go set this to radial and I want to switch the values. Well, this remap ramp starts at zero on the left hand side and goes all the way up to one. So if I turn this the other way around where we start at one and then go down to zero and then I draw out my radial circle, there we go. Now we have the ability to make the spheres bigger as they are closer to the chameleon. But let's say that I don't want the spheres being really big next to the chameleon. Actually, as they get close to the chameleon, I want these spheres to go down in size so that it doesn't go through our geometry or distract from the chameleon's face and the butterfly. Well, I can just take this ramp, I'll bring it over a little bit, and I'll bring this down right in the area that I started dragging from. So if I start dragging from his face right here, it's only going to start making things bigger as we go further and further away from that initial location that we dragged from. So if we do this kind of thing, we can see that the spheres aren't big next to his face, but then they get big, like right here. So let's do that. Let's drag right around here, and then we'll generally encompass the entire scene. So that near the face, we don't really have many spheres, but then as we go away, we start getting these spheres popping up. Now, if we have this little ghost viewport here, it's kind of hard to see. So go to the top right. And this, by the way, will allow you to show all objects because by default, it's going to ghost other objects. So now if we say show all objects, we can really see that. And this is great because now, again, we don't have the particles really big next to his face, but we can bring this down and kind of gradually make it bigger as it goes away. So let's say right around here might be a good value. Eh, let's go a little bit more right about there. Okay, awesome. Let's also do this. I don't want this going all the way up to one. I want this going up to 0.1 like that. And there we go. Now we have some really awesome values for our P scale. 
Here's the moral of the story, guys. When it comes to attributes, as a beginner, anytime you want to create or modify attributes, I want you to think about the attribute creates, which just makes a value, the attribute noise, which makes a collection of values that have a shape to them, the attribute randomize, which will, well, randomize the values on a per point basis, or the attribute adjust, which allows you to create zones based on what you do in the viewport. As long as you remember these nodes, as a beginner, anytime you want to create or adjust attributes, you'll have the tools to do so. Now in the future, we are going to get into VEX where we actually code stuff. And that is also another option for creating attributes. But again, as a beginner, I think that it's best to start with these nodes. And then as you get older and more wise and advanced, then you can start tackling VEX. So anyway, back to the task at hand. We want these particles to wispfully go in the wind and blow around and stuff, right? Well, we need to animate parameters to do that. So let's go to our attribute noise for position up here. And as we play around with the amplitude, we can see that our particles move around like this. Right now, they're going from the bottom left up to the top right. And the reason why that's happening is because we are currently adding to position. We are adding positive values. And the positive direction in XYZ goes up in that diagonal direction. So that's why it's going in that direction. However, if we change the range values to zero centered, now it's going to go both in the positive direction and in the negative direction. So as we turn this up, now we just have something a bit more chaotic and random, which is exactly what I'm looking for. In order to animate this, hold down Alt and then click on the text right here. As soon as I did that, we'll notice down here at the timeline that we have a green tick. That's called a keyframe. It's storing that value at that section of time. Now, as I go into the future, let's say we're at 120 frames, I'll make another keyframe. Hold down Alt and click the text again. And this time, let's set the amplitude to, oh, I don't know, a value where we want this to end. So let's say we want this to end at about four. Okay. We are going from zero to four. And now as I hold down left mouse and I go over the timeline, we could see that it's changing this value over time. And that's giving us the animation. To play back this animation though, the best way to do it is to create something called a flip book. So if we go to the bottom left here, we see this little flip book icon and we'll hold left mouse and click on flipbook with new settings. So by default, it says $RF start and $RF end. That takes your scene timeline, so from one to the scene timeline of 240. Let's just do this to 120 right now though, because we only have our keyframes happening in those areas. And I'll say start. Now it's going to build up this animation, but when I go to play this back, it's going to play it back at the proper frames per second. Your viewport, when you press play, it tries to go and play this at 24 frames per second, but it doesn't always do a good job. So that's why we're making this flip book so that we can save these images and know that now we're really looking at 24 frames per second. And this will just loop back and forth. Okay, so this animation's working, but we'll notice that it kind of starts off slowly and then towards the end, it slows down. I want this to be a constant motion. I don't want this to you know, speed up and slow down much at all. I just want this to be a steady movement over time. So in order to change the behavior of that animation, 
hold down shift, and then middle mouse the text here for amplitude. This will bring up the animation editor. And the first thing I do with the animation editor is I hold down spacebar F. And this will give us that animation over time. If I drag through here, it's like dragging through our timeline. And we can see that these values start at a low value and then they gradually go up and then they gradually stay the same where they slow down. This kind of animation, by the way, is called an ease in and ease out. But anyway, let's just highlight these two keyframes right here. And I'll go to the top and set this to a straight tangent. So now we have a constant motion. We're not slowing down or speeding up. We just have a steady increase of values. And by the way, on the Y axis of this, this is the value that we keyframed. So this is the amplitude value. We start at zero and we go up to four. And so that's what we see right here. All right, so now that we have that, you can minimize this or we can just exit out. And now as I play, we have something kind of like this. Again, to get the most accurate representation, you'll have to use a flip book, but this gives you a pretty general idea of what this is doing. Okay, so that's cool, but I think it's still going a bit too fast. So now I want to stretch this animation out over a longer period of time. Well, there's a really cool way of doing that here in our timeline. Hold down shift, left mouse drag, that's going to highlight this keyframe at 120. Once that keyframe is highlighted, then hold down middle mouse, and that will drag this over to, let's say the very end at 240. So now, shift middle mouse the amplitude, spacebar F, we can see that we went all the way over to 240. And by the way, if you want to zoom here in the animation editor, alt right mouse, alt middle mouse will pan, and it's pretty similar to the node view or the viewport in that way. But yeah, we could see that we now took this over more frames. Let's now do another flip book and see what this looks like when we go from the start all the way over to 240. So that gives us this and it's looking pretty good, but I do want to slow down the movement of these guys. I don't think it's graceful enough right now. <laughs> so to change the value that we keyframed, go ahead and take your cursor down here to 240 and I can use the left and right mouse buttons, by the way, to scrub on over there. As soon as we are at the frame, it should turn green and now I can just type in a value of two. That'll make this move half as quickly as it did before. So now we're going from zero to two. Let's do another flip book, see what happens. And now we have this, which I think looks really cool. When you're all ready to bring this over to Karma again, highlight the copy to points, press tab, and create an output node. If I hold down shift and enter while that's highlighted, that's going to automatically connect it to the currently selected node, which was the copy to points. This output node is cool because anytime we go to refer to this particles build network, it's always going to pick this output right here. So even if you accidentally leave your visibility up here, it's always going to grab the output down here where you want it to go. Now, while we're here, I do want to talk about one thing that I haven't mentioned yet that's important to know, and that's this little purple zone on our node. That little purple zone is the render flag. And so if you didn't have this output right here, this network would try to find the thing with the purple flag and take the geometry at that point. So back before Karma existed, if you were using Mantra, this would actually be the thing that would get sent to Mantra. And so that's why we have that little purple flag right there. 
And again, if you don't have an output node, it's going to listen to wherever the purple flag is. So just keep that in mind. It's one common mistake people make is they don't have an output node and they leave their visibility up here. And then when they go to import into Solaris, it's not grabbing the right section of their SOP network. So that's why I want to bring it up. In this case, it's, it's just going to aim for the output, so we're fine. But there you go. Now you know. All right, so let's go back to the top, say Solaris, because we're going to work within USD land. And now on our scene imports, I want to bring in those particles. By the way, if this ever shows up, if it ever goes black up there, you can always reset the viewport by going up to labs, reset viewport. That button, by the way, has moved over time. So if you're watching this and it's not there, keep going through these menus and somewhere in these menus will be a reset viewport. <laughs> so anyway, there we go. That got rid of that weird black bar. I also want to make it easier for us to see what's happening here. So hover the mouse over the viewport, D for viewport display options. Go to the background, turn off display environment lights as background. That gets rid of that guy. Color scheme, dark. It's a little easier on the eyes. And we can exit out there, do the flat shading, and we can go down here to our light handle toggle. And that will get rid of our light handles. There we go. Just for preview purposes, those options are good to always keep in mind. So like I was saying, we can go to the scene import now and under the objects, let's include the particles build. So hold down control and click that to add it to the current selection, accept pattern. And there we go. Now we brought it in and it's going to animate just fine. It's a little choppy, but it's there. And after we do a test render, it's looking pretty cool. I do want to turn down the scale of these particles, but before I do that, it's also a good idea to assign a shader. Whenever you have a new object, you need to make sure that you assign a shader to that object so that it renders properly. The reason why it's rendering properly right now is because Houdini is really smart. <laughs> it recognized that there wasn't a shader assigned to these points. So it made us a default shader before it rendered invisible to us. And that's why we're able to see this in our viewport. But again, it's much better to make our own shader so that we have more control over how these particles look. So let's go back up to the material library. We'll double click inside of here and we're going to make a new karma material builder. Let's call this our particles material. Head inside, press enter, and we have this material standard surface, which should be good for us to get started. Let's set this to a blue color so that we can test this in our viewport, make sure that we assign it properly first. So we'll go back here. I'm going to press this little plus icon, and that's going to make another entry. This entry is going to assign it to our particles. So let's go back in here. Highlight that, control C to copy that name, paste it in both of those fields, and we want to assign it to geometry. Allow me to take my face here and put it up here. There we go. Now we'll take our particles build. We'll drag that over. And just like we did with the chameleon, I'll say forward slash star star. So it grabs everything under the particles build and it assigns it to that. Okay, let's do another test render and see what happens. And yes, we have in fact assigned that shader because I see those blue spheres. All right, cool. Let's go back to our particles material. In order to bring in the color attribute that was on our SOP geometry, material X, which is the shader that we're using, requires something specific. Press tab, keyword color, and we want to find the geometry color. This will automatically find that CD attribute 
that we set on our particles. And now if I bring down that dropdown of base, we can plug that into the base color. And we can see that this setting right here now has been grayed out because it's taking in this override from this node right here. Let's re-kick that render and see what happened. And there we go, now it works. Here's another thing that I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to the object level and I'll go back to our particles build for a moment, highlight the P scale setting, and I'm going to turn this up really high so that we can really see these spheres when we go back to the stage or lops. Once I'm in here, I'm going to re-kick XPU and I'm going to play around with some of these settings in the material standard surface node. All right, so it's pretty, uh, pretty hard to see what's going on because of that depth of field. If you zoom out a little bit, that'll get rid of the depth of field and now we can really see these spheres. Okay, so now as I turn down the base color here, we can see that this actually looks you know, a bit better. It's not as bright as it was before. If we go to the specular, this is kind of like how shiny things are. We can turn up the roughness and that'll remove some of the shininess that was part of that. We can also go down to the transmission and this will make it a see-through object. So if I go up in here, it's going to increase our render times, but it's going to turn this into a bunch of bubble looking things. And that's kind of cool. This gives us that transparency. If you do decide to use this transparency though, then go to the roughness here on the specular tab and set that to zero. This will render a lot faster now and it'll give us more of that bubble look. Also, we lost our color and that's because now transmission's going to use this color right here. So I can just browse under the transmission section and we have transmission color. Boom, plug that in. Now we have our color back. So as you can see, you can just have fun playing around with this a little bit. I think it's nice just to mess around with these parameters to get used to the shader a little bit. And don't worry about what these settings do too much right now, just have fun with it. You can play around with the sheen, that'll give this like a, a silhouette, like a light along the edge of these shapes. So that's kind of fun. And like I said, just have some fun with it. I'll take the transmission back down to zero for right now. And let's take our sheen down to zero, subsurface. This will make it kind of uh, glowy a little bit. We can go right there and then, you know, go to subsurface, subsurface color, and have it listen to that guy as well. So anyway, I'm going to just leave it at this for now. And once you're done playing around with all this, then just go back to the object level again. And let's take our P scale down to 0 0.05, something really tiny. So you get the shading the way you like it when it's really big, and then you take the particles back on down. And then when we restart the render, we should see a slightly improved version of these particles. And then again, go back to the camera one to get that depth of field in there. And after sending out a test render JPEG, we have this. So I think it's looking pretty good. Let's now add in that camera effect. I'll also talk about groups and how to select stuff. We'll send out the final render, the final sequence, and I'll show you how to complete the project by making a video. To get our camera dolly effect, let's make sure that this is paused and then go to the Houdini GL. This will bring us back to our viewport. I'm going to highlight our camera. Go ahead and set a keyframe on this translate and we'll pop out of our camera. And one great way to have your viewport and then have the camera visible at the same time is to go to the top right here. And we can say split by two views side by side. So if we do that, and then we go here and we change this 
to our camera. That will allow us to have both the view from our camera and to be able to pan around in here. Let's bring our cursor over to frame 240. One way to do that accurately is by going down here and typing out 240. So as soon as I do that, we're at frame 240. Again, set a keyframe right there. And now I'll just take our camera and move it back. Let's go right about there or so. We want to have straight linear tangents. So hold down shift and middle mouse to translate text. Spacebar F will frame everything in. Alt right mouse will zoom and then highlight everything and make it a straight curve so that we're not easing in and easing out of that animation. Okay, so there we go. Now we have that camera animation and we can kind of see what's happening if we just scrub through our timeline like this. Now the next part to this whole trick is to actually zoom in on the camera itself. So what I'll do is I'll take a look at where this horn is. Look at the top horn and look at where this sits in our frame. It's kind of at this top area right here. And so visually speaking, I want to align the top of the horn with about right there on our frame. So we'll go back to frame 240. I'll type that in down there. And now on our camera, I'm gonna go find the area or find the setting that zooms in. That's going to be our focal length right here. So as I turn this up, we can see that we're zooming in. And like I said before, I want to look at this horn and try to line it up with this part of the frame. So right about there, it's pretty good. So that's gonna be 80 millimeters about. Go ahead and keyframe that. We'll go back to frame one and then we're gonna keyframe this again and at frame one, we're going to be at 50, which is where it was before. Again, shift middle mouse, this focal length, spacebar F to frame, highlight everything, linear. And now let's do a play blast to see what this looks like. However, before we do a play blast here, let's also press D for display and bring back our backgrounds here to see if we can actually see that background distorting over time. So I'm going to go down here, say flipbook, and then let's uh, just hit start. That'll go the full 240 frames. All right, there we go. It looks really cool. So that's totally working now. When the depth of field comes in, it'll look even cooler because then we, then we see all this blurry stuff in the backdrop and it's got this weird trippy thing happening. And anyway, it's gonna be great. There are two more things I want to do before we complete this. I want to animate our butterfly right here so that it starts over here and then it gradually goes this way. This is also just going to be a good excuse to talk about groups with you guys. So we'll talk about groups and we'll use groups to help us do that. Also, I want to do something with our particles. I want to grab random particles, a certain number of particles, and I want to animate them floating upwards. I did kind of like it when our particles were all moving in this diagonal direction. It felt like everything was going up and that's really cool. However, I only want to do this for random particles. So we need some kind of way of randomly selecting each particle and then animating them going upwards in the Y direction just a little bit. So these are the, are the two things we're gonna do next. And again, the key to all this is going to be groups. Back here in the scene, let's go to the object level and change this back to build. There we go. Back to the old SOP worlds that we like to be in. All right, so what is a group? You might ask. A group is a selection. That's all it really is. And before we do this with the particles, let's actually go inside of our chameleon network. And I want to grab our butterfly. So to select something here in Houdini, S for select, that'll bring up your selection tool. We can just highlight all of these polygons. And there we go, we've selected that. Or we can go here to points and that will highlight these points. Now, if I press 
T for transform, it's going to make this edit node. And you'll notice that the group field up here has these IDs. It has a range of IDs listed in that group. This correlates with the point IDs. So again, we can go right here. We could take a look at these numbers and that's exactly the range of numbers that the edit SOP is grabbing. However, you do need to be careful about this because if these numbers ever change, if these point IDs ever change, then this node is going to grab the wrong thing. As an example, let's say in the future you wanted to poly reduce this butterfly. So you go here and let's just say we go to the group field up here. You can click this select icon. And now let's just highlight all of these guys. So now that poly reduce is only going to work on these primitives. If we then go and change this percentage to keep to 10, that will change these IDs because now we have less points in our scene. So whenever you add points or remove points, that's going to change up these point IDs. And so if let's say you had a transform node and before the transform was looking at these guys, these IDs, and then you did the poly reduce and you tried moving those IDs, it wouldn't work. It would grab the wrong things. So now you can see that it's grabbing some polygons over here now. That's because we changed up the topology when the geometry changed, it changed the IDs, and now this guy is grabbing the wrong stuff. So anyway, that all goes to say that if you select things and you're, you're noticing these IDs right here, you just have to be careful and your geometry can't change. You can't add or remove points because then this is going to mess up. Just something to keep in mind. Okay, so that begs the question, how can we select this without the IDs? Well, fortunately for us, we have a group node. Hold down shift, enter, that will automatically connect this. And now with this group, we have different ways of selecting these polygons. By default, this base group is pretty much the same thing as what we did last time. If you click that arrow and we highlight this, press enter, it's just going to grab these IDs. However, we have other options, such as keep and bounding regions. Let's turn that on. Now, we have this little box, and as long as your multi-widget tool is on, we are able to move this box. And let's say we just move it here to where the butterfly is. There we go. Anything that's in the box is going to be part of this group, this selection. Now, if let's say I did a poly reduce, it wouldn't matter because the way that we're selecting things isn't based on ID anymore. It's not based on those point IDs or those prim IDs. It's based on whatever's in the box. So even if I change this geometry, this group is going to stay intact because of how we selected everything. It's not reliant on the IDs anymore. So a lot of times when you're trying to make selections in Houdini, it's best to try to do so using a bounding box or using something besides the point or the primitive IDs, because this is able to maintain its selection no matter what you do above it. So anyway, we have that. Uh, we could change this group name to our butterfly underscore group. And now if we hover over the group node and we press this information icon, we can see we have a primitive group, this butterfly group. And we have 5,501 primitives. A primitive, by the way, is the same thing as a polygon. So it's the actual plane. It's the actual little piece right here. It's not just the point. However, we can change this to points. So we can go to points now. Now the points are highlighted. If we hold down middle mouse, we now have a butterfly group that is a point group instead of a prim group. So depending on what kind of geometry components you want to select, you can select points, prims, and 
edges and vertices. So most of the time you want points or prims. So we'll just leave it here at points. Okay, cool. So that now works. In the future, let's say I want to transform something. I can just go to this little drop down. And now I have this butterfly group that I can use. So when I move this butterfly, it will always listen to that point selection that was saved in this group right here. And this group, by the way, carries on. So it's not just here on this group node. Now it's part of the geometry and we can use it whenever we want. That all being said, let's get rid of that poly reduce. That was just for educational purposes. And let's actually transform this butterfly. You'll notice though, that we don't have a transform handle on that butterfly. If we zoom out, he's way over there. So why is that happening? <laughs> What's he doing? Well, unfortunately the transform node by default isn't going to center the handles over your group selection. Even if I did the IDs, it wouldn't really work. One way to manually do this is to press the insert key. You'll notice that it changed the mode here of our little gnomon. And now we can actually move this guy around. Then hold down X, think X for snapping. Kind of makes a snapping crosshairs, right? So the way I think of it, turn on points. So now it will snap to the points as we go hover over, let's say our butterfly here. And then once we have our gnomon where we want it to be, press insert again, and we will exit out of the pivot mode. One last thing, these arrows are pointing in a weird way. In order to cycle through the different gnomon orientations, press M. We could see what these are doing based on the text at the bottom of the viewport here. So it says handle is aligned to construction plane, aligned to components, object, world. And it just cycles through all the different modes. So in this case, we can just set it to world and that's perfectly fine. Anyway, that's a little bit about moving pivots and snapping. Uh, we'll talk more about that if you decide to follow the, the modeling course. I go, I kind of reemphasize these things because they're hard to remember at first. Anyway, that being said, we have this on our butterfly. Let's turn off our snapping by holding down X and then highlighting the points again. Now we can just move this around like normal. Okay, cool. So now that we're ready to animate, let's have him start back here. Alt left mouse to keyframe, we'll go to 240 and we'll have him face to face with Mr. Iguana dude. Shift middle mouse, spacebar F. You guys know the drill, highlight this, make it linear. Now we have this. Awesome. So that does it for our butterfly. And we can always change this later if we want to dial it in. But now we have a good animation. The next question is how can we use groups to randomly select these particles and move some of them upwards in the Y direction? As you can imagine, the group node has exactly what we're looking for. Let's turn off this base group. Let's call this our particles up group, and then we'll only check on this keep by random chance. Let's plug this in before the spheres are copied over. It's not going to work if you do this on the spheres, because then if we zoom in, we could see what's happening here. It's going to look at the polygons on those spheres and randomly select those. It's not what we're trying to do here. We want to instead do this on the points. Let's also go to the top and change this from a primitive group type to a point group type. It's going to be hard to see these points though. So let's hover our mouse over the viewport, press D for display, go to background and change the color scheme here to dark. Now we can really see this. All right, as we change the percents here, you'll notice that it's going to highlight and unhighlight things. So. Let's take maybe 33% of our particles, and those are gonna be the ones that move upwards in the Y direction. Make a transform node, 
drag it in. We can select our particles up group, and now we have the ability to move them around. Let's set our visibility down here to the transform as well and highlight that. Now we can see what this is doing. Okay, cool. With that being the case, I'm going to set a keyframe, frame zero, go to 240, another keyframe, and the only thing I want to change here is the Y direction. I want them going up. So let's set this to a value of one. And what this will do is just take these guys and bring them up. That's really it. Again, shift, middle mouse, spacebar F, highlight, linear, and there we go. Now we just have the particles generally floating upwards, about 33% of them, and it just makes it feel like everything is going up a bit more than it was before. If we wanna change that, we can just turn up this percentage and we can get more of that upward moving feel to it, like that. So it's a pretty cool way of controlling this animation, this behavior. We can just take this percentage and that's basically like saying how much upward movement you want. And there we go, now we have this. All right, cool. So that's one way of doing it. I do wanna show you one other way of selecting these points. So if you didn't want to use this group node, you could also use attribute values to select things. As an example, if I had an attribute randomize and we plug that in, Let's set this to a dimensions of one so that it will give us one float value. And we're going to set a random value between zero and one. So we have that. I'm going to make my own custom attribute now. I'll call it my adder. You can call it whatever you want to call it. If we go to the geo spreadsheet, my adder now has a random value between zero and one. So now, if I wanted to use a transform, and I want that transform to look at the attribute and only select something if it was a certain value. I could say this, at my adder, if that value is above 0.5, then go ahead and grab those points. The group type should be points because we made a point attribute. And as soon as I do that, we could take the translate and that works too. Now we've selected those points. So really, really cool. That's just another way that you can select things using attribute values. So just to recap with groups, most of the time you want to use the group node when making a selection of something. This has just about everything you need. If the group node doesn't have what you need, then consider doing it this way where you have an attributes and then you use the attribute value to determine whether or not a node is allowed to work on points or primitives or whatever you're selecting. That's the two main ways that you would select things in Houdini as you're trying to do various things. So anyway, there you have it guys. That is all about groups. There's more to be said about it, especially if you want to get into procedural modeling and, you know, more complicated stuff. But for the vast majority of situations, what you just learned will work just fine. With that all being said, we now have our upward motion and our butterfly. So let's go to the stage and move on to final rendering. Once we're back here in Solaris, Go to the top right here and change this back to a single view. That'll bring us back to where we were before. And what we want to do is send out a low quality test render. So if we go to the Karma render settings, we have these path trace samples. And again, this is the number of times Karma is going to think about the accurate color for each pixel. So right now it thinks about it 512 times per pixel. Let's turn this down though to about 50. That's a very low quality render right there. But that's okay because it'll be really fast. Let's also change this output picture because this tells Karma where to save this image. So we'll click on this button, say dollar hip, 
That again is where we saved our scene file. Go to render, make a new folder here called test sequence render. So you could say new folder up there if you don't have that yet. And then I'll say this, test sequence render underscore dollar F4. That expression right there, $F4, says take the current frame number, which right now is frame one, and make sure that that number has four digits in it. So it's going to go zero, 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 one. That's the standard convention when saving out frames. You have a bunch of zeros in front of that number. And there's reasons for that, but you know, suffice to say that's the standard. And just trust me on that, you wanna say $F4. Dot, for right now, JPG for JPEG. We're not going to save the final render out as a JPEG, but for now, this is going to be very easy for us to preview what's happening. Okay, so we say accept right there, and then let's go down to the USD render op. It says render current frame, and we will render to disk. Now, as soon as I click that, nothing happens. At least in this version of Houdini, nothing pops up, nothing lets you know that something just happened. However, if you go up to the render tab up here and we say scheduler, this will show us what's happening with that render. And we can see this very top one right now is thinking about some kind of thing. So this lets us know that something is rendering and just keep that in mind in the future. Whenever you press that render to disk, you need to bring this up to actually see what's happening. When it's done, it should be at 100%, and then we can go searching for that image. So here is our test sequence render, and well, it doesn't look so good, does it? <laughs> our depth of field is off, good to know. That makes perfect sense because we animated our camera and the camera's focus point isn't animated right now. So let's go highlight our camera and we will click this multi widget tool. And then we could see that this handle over here is where the camera is focusing. So I'll bring that back to the chameleon's face. Let's just bring it right there. And we need to figure out where this parameter actually is. So under the sampling tab, this focus distance is the parameter that's changing as we move this around. I'm going to keyframe this. So at frame one, we're at that value. And then when we go to 240 again, so let's go to 240, let's move this again so that we are looking right at his face the whole time. And we should be able to see that there's a keyframe right there. And let's also hit shift, middle mouse, spacebar F, zoom out, make sure that everything is linear. So now, as I play forward here, even if the camera's moving, we should notice that it's not going to lose focus at that spot, which is great. So now that we have this working, that fixes that issue. Let's send out another test render. And now that everything is in focus, we have a different problem. What's going on with his neck, huh? It's like he got a little disease or a parasite or something terrible happened to him. <laughs> well, this is where things get a little interesting, my friends. So this geometry right here is something that you may or may not see in your scene. In the future, this could be, again, an, an area that side effects might address or improve. What's happening here, though, is that when we hid our nulls over here, remember way back when we had that weird cross section happening? So let's go ahead and just see this a bit more easily now. Uh, so what I'm talking about is in this scene graph path, we can turn back on these nulls and let's set this to light we have these little cross things right well when we turned that off that change did not make its way to the information that's being sent to karma over here 
That's because as of right now, this scene graph path doesn't actually influence the information that gets sent to Karma when you use the USD render wrap. It's almost like this is a temporary viewport change. And to make matters more confusing, when we do a test render in this viewport, that is showing us the overrides we have down here. So there is a mismatch between the information we see when we do a test render over here and the actual information that gets sent over via the USD render wrap. Again, in the future, I think this is an area that will be improved because I think it's a good idea to make this more consistent. But here nor there, if this is happening to you, the solution is fairly simple if you know where to look. Just go to this little orange looking orb, hold down left mouse and say, create inline USD node from viewport overrides. Of course, right? <laughs> but now that you know where to look, that's where you go and makes all this code right here that makes those overrides for us. And now when we save this out, it should hide those nulls, which was responsible for those weird spheres that we were seeing before. And now we're all good. I do want to say that most things in Houdini aren't that nuanced and difficult. I think right now this is just one of those weird quirks that will probably be addressed in the future. But again, if you ran into that with your scene, now you know where to go and it's as easy as pressing that one button to fix all of it. So now back to our render settings. I want to change a couple things now. Our resolution, this is how many pixels makes up our image. I want to change that to 1920. So if I say 1920, press enter, it'll automatically say 1920 by 1080. Where am I getting that resolution? Well, that is a standard resolution for HD, for high-end HD. If you want to just Google HD resolutions for TV, it'll give you 1920 by 1080. So depending on where you want to have this animation displayed, look up the resolution for that. And then that is the amount of pixels being created. 1920 is the width and then 1080 is the height. So it's creating a grid based on that. Okay, so 50 samples here is not going to be enough. I can already tell you that right now. When you have a low quality render, we have all of this grain, or this is also called noise. So if we zoom in here, we can really see all of this right here. And it looks very ugly, almost like a, a bad TV static or something like that. So the more samples we have, the more accurate these colors are going to be. And the less of this noise, the less of this grain we're going to see. In order to figure out the ideal number of samples, here's what I'd recommend doing. Start at frame one at 50 samples. Then go to frame two, set another keyframe, 100. Then frame three, 250. Frame four, 500. Frame five, 750. Frame six, 1000 and then frame seven 1250 so I basically go up in increments of 250 samples so in order to now render this out we'll go to the USD render wrap and we want to say render a specific frame range again you can right click this text here and say delete channels if these are filled with this light blue color and so I'll say render out one to seven, and I, I may not do the full seven frames, but we're going to render that out, and then we can see how the grain changes over time as we increase these samples. So now I'll just open up this image right here, and then I could use my arrow keys to move on to the next photo. So again, this is frame one, 50 samples. This will be 100 samples. And I'm going to keep my eye on these grainy areas. So pick a sphere that's kind of grainy, keep your eye at that zone, 
and watch how the grain changes over time. So again, 50, 100, 250, 500, 750. As soon as we hit 750, we'll notice that there really isn't a whole lot of change happening now. So from 500 to 750, there is an improvement, but that improvement is very small. As we go further, we'll notice that it does improve, but it's really not improving by much at this point. So that tells me 750 is probably a good number for this because after 750, we really don't see too much more of a benefit after that point. So now I'll go back to our Karma render settings, get rid of the path trace samples channels. So right click, delete channels that will remove all of our keyframes. And I will set that to 750. Now there still was some grain in there. And if you were to play that as an animation, that grain would look worse because it would be flickering over time. However, we do have a really cool option here that can remove that. But what you do is you go to the image output and you scroll down and we have this denoiser. If you're using a NVIDIA graphics card, you have this NVIDIA Optex denoiser. That's my personal pick. But if not, there's also this Intel OIDN. So these are just two different styles of denoising your image. I'll go with the NVIDIA denoiser. And now when I send out a render, let's take a look at that same thing, but now with the denoiser. All right, so now we have this. As I zoom in, you really can't tell that there's any noise in there anymore. These colors are very smooth. So that is awesome. Now you might have also noticed that these colors are off or they're really not quite the same as the colors we saw in our viewport render. That may or may not be happening to you right now. That could be another change in the future with Houdini, but don't worry about it because when we save out the final render, we're not going to be saving out JPEGs. We're going to be saving out a different file format for that. So now let's go back to Houdini and we're going to change this uh, output picture path right here. This time I'm going to make a new folder and we're going to call this our final frames. And we'll call this final frames underscore dollar f4 dot exr this exr file format has more data stored into that file and when we go to take this to our video editing software davinci resolve we'll be able to use that extra data to give ourselves more control when we're trying to color correct things or make the image look great so for the final quality render I do suggest using EXRs because it gives you that extra data. All right, so now we have that. One more thing before we send off the final render, it's going to take a long time to do this, so make sure that everything's good. What I like doing is I like sending out another flipbook. So I'll move my photo here so we can see it. Go over here, flipbook with new settings, and just to make sure that everything is what we expect it to be, let's do one more going from one to 240. And sure enough, everything looks like it's working just fine. Don't forget to change the frame range one to 240. And then also control shift S, save a new version of your scene file. Notice how I'm versioning up here every single time. So now we're at version 18 and then you can send this off to render. It is going to take a long time, so just keep that in mind. As that's rendering, it's good to think about how we're going to take these pictures and turn it into video. That's where we have DaVinci Resolve. DaVinci Resolve is an entirely different application. This isn't Houdini related, but this will allow you to take those frames and turn it into a video clip. So you can download that for free. There's a free download right here. Uh, you can also buy the studio version, which right now is $295 and that's a one-time buy. 
I have the studio version. I think it's great. I think it's a great price for what you get. But what's great about it is that you do have a free option. So download that and then we'll open DaVinci and I'll show you what to do from there. So I'll just use this project. This is what I'm using to make this course right now. And if we go to the edit tab at the very bottom, this will bring you to the timeline. When you have a few frames rendered, it's a good idea to check it in here. So I'll go to the chameleon project, render final frames, and then I will highlight all four frames and drag it in. There we go. We should have this little frame. Just hold left mouse to snap on over to it. Plus key, we'll zoom in. And then we can use our arrows left and right to play this through. So one of the first things you'll notice is that the colors are way off. I don't want to get into the technical reasons why they're off, but believe me when I say that this is actually doing what it's supposed to do. When we saved out that EXR file, it has a bunch of information in it. And usually when you save out an EXR file, you have to color correct it for the monitor that you're viewing this on. So what we'll do is go to the effects tab up here. If this isn't on, then make sure that you go to effects and then we'll type in aces and we'll drag over this aces transform right there. Make sure that this is highlighted. Make sure that your inspector at the top right is turned on and then go to the effects tab and this is where we can adjust those settings. For the input transform, go all the way down to the bottom. sRGB linear is what you want. And then for the output transform, scroll down and choose sRGB. I know this is confusing and this feels really advanced right now for a beginner, but just for right now, copy what I do and this will give you a lot more control when you go to color correct your images in the future. Uh, the reason why this happens is because when you save out that 32-bit image or that EXR image with all the information in it, it's assumed that you are a super professional compositor <laughs> and that you know what you're doing and that you want to have all the control in the world over what device you're trying to display this image on. Because if this was on a movie projector, you would choose different options here versus a computer screen versus other things. So that's why there's all these controls here. And that's why Houdini exported that image like you saw it did. Anyway, here nor there, for right now, just know these two settings. And then when you get more advanced, you can spend more time studying color science and color theory. All right, cool. So that gives us this image. Let's zoom in and see if we can find anything wrong before we wait another 24 hours for this thing to finish. Let's zoom in to, let's say 200%. And then I'll use my middle mouse to pan around. I went straight for the face here because this is the most important area of the frame. We want to make sure that the face is in focus and that we are drawn to the chameleon. However, we can see that the depth of field isn't actually in the right spot. It's on his horn right there, but it's actually not hitting his eye. And that's where we want that clarity to be. So because we have such a strong depth of field, we'll need to go back and make sure that that camera focus point is aligned perfectly with that eye. So I'll go back and do that. I only rendered out five frames or so, so it's really not a big deal at this point. But besides that, I think this looks awesome. Uh, while we're here, let's also talk about various ways we can make this look better. Uh, if you go over here to the effects or the different filters that come with Resolve, we have some pretty cool things. For instance, I can keyword search here, glow. And I can drag that over. And now as I change this shine threshold, I can make different areas glow in a very magical fantasy kind of way, which is really cool. So I'll go right there and then I'll go down to the bottom and I'll go to this global blend. Start at zero. 
that has no effect and go up until you start really noticing this and then go back down. You always want to be very subtle with these effects. You want to feel the effect and not notice the effect. That's what makes things look much more professional. The next thing we want to do, try vignettes. So V-I-G. There it is. Vignettes. Drag that over. This will darken the edges of our frame. And the cool thing about that is it'll take more of our attention and put it towards the face. Let's start by taking our size down or up. Let's actually go up with that so that we have more of that face being shown. And then go to the global blend here. Start at zero, go up until you really start noticing it. Okay, we've gone too far, then go back. So right around 27% or 0.27. Awesome. Now, depending on the version of Resolve, you may or may not have some of these other effects, but go ahead and play around with it. It's a lot of fun. Let me show you another thing that you'll want to do. On the glowing vignette, let's turn this off for now and go to the very bottom under the color section. To get your screen to look like this, turn off all the stuff at the top here. I have this wheel selected. I have this selected. And then on the right hand side, this little histogram thing selected. Now by default, it should show you something like that, but change that parade to the histogram. And this will give us a breakdown of how many pixels are black, which is zero, and how many pixels are white, which is at the very right hand side at 1023. So this is a distribution of how bright things are. And as I change things over here with these wheels, it's going to move the values. So watch this. I'll grab this wheel on the gamma slider. And as I move this over, we can see that it's changing the histogram layout of where these pixel values are located. So what I want to do when adjusting this is I want to make sure that we don't have too many things hitting this zero. See how we have it all the way up here with the zero? That's not good. That means lots of things are going to a pure black value and they are losing detail. So the first thing I'll do is I'll grab my gamma, I'll bring it over, and I'll also take my lift and I'll bring that over. And the combination of those two things is going to prevent some of these pixels from being perfectly black. So just do a little bit right about there. Then we can take our gain and we could turn that up to make this image pop a little bit more. So you'll notice that if I go down, it's kind of dull. As I go up, it really makes this whole thing pop out at you. However, you do have to be careful because on the right hand side, we can see that we're starting to clip our whites. These values are going up on the very right hand side. And that means we're hitting pure whites in areas like this, for instance. So we don't want too much gain, but we do want a little bit. So we'll go just a little bit. We do see that it is clipping, but then we can fix that later by fine tuning this. Also, let's go down to the saturation, which is right here. And we can turn that up to make things a bit more colorful as well. We can make those colors more intense. I'll go to a value of 60 and then I'll maybe add a little bit of contrast here as well. You don't want too much contrast, just a little bit right there. Okay, once you're ready to dial this in, we then go to the HDR section and these color wheels relate to different sections of this histogram. So if I click this arrow, I'm now all the way to the left hand side. These are my dark values, starting with black, then it goes dark, shadow, and as I go to the right, eventually we get to specular, which is on the right hand side of this histogram. So anyway, I'll take this black and turn up the exposure just a little bit. And then with the dark, I want to bring this down. I want to make this pop. And so by taking my dark down and even my shadows down a little bit, that will separate the chameleon from the backdrop, which is good. 
Now in the process, it makes our chameleon feel too bright now. So I'll take this light and I'll bring that down to kind of chill it out. And then I'll keep going over here until I hit the highlights and then bring that down a little bit as well. So there you go. I think from here, I might take our contrast, turn that down maybe to 0.98. There we go. And then at this point, just use your eyes. But when you make these adjustments, just be very careful and very subtle about it. You don't want to go too crazy uh, because then it looks really amateur. Uh, so there you go. The saturation, maybe 55 instead of 60. I like that. Once you've color corrected this, we can go back to our glow and our vignette, and then we have this all here to play with again. So we can go like that, and then maybe redial in some of these settings that we had before. By playing around with these things in post, they call this post because you're not in 3D anymore. So by doing this post stuff, you're already ahead of about 80 to 90% of junior artists. I kid you not. <laughs> it makes a huge difference as to the final quality of the image. So that's why I want to put it in this course. Even though this isn't specifically Houdini related, this shows you what to do once you've rendered something out in Houdini to get to that professional looking level. I'll go back and fix up that whole issue with the eye focus thing. And then I'm going to render this out. It'll take me 24 hours. I figured that because it took, well, six minutes to render one frame times 240 frames divided by 60 minutes per hour, 24 hours. Tomorrow, this will be done and let's see what it looks like. It's a new day, it's a new render. Let's check out the final result. This is before. This is before DaVinci Resolve, all the post effects stuff we did. This is what came out of Houdini. Then, after. So we could see that all of this post work, all the stuff that we just did in Resolve makes a pretty massive difference. So as part of your workflow, it's really important that you study DaVinci Resolve, that you get comfortable with some of these effects, even if it's just a little bit of glow and color correction. Most of the time, that's all you need, and that'll get you a really long ways at making this look great. When you're ready for the final render, set the area that you want to render by taking your cursor, pressing I for in, and then going to the very end of that clip and saying O for out. Once you have that, you go to the deliver and then browse for where you want it to go. So in this case, I will go to my Houdini for the new artist folder. And let's just call this our final render V1 as an example. You can call that whatever you want, but there we go. There's the name network optimizations on make sure that you have MP4 selected H.264. I have the NVIDIA encoder. However, this is probably either audio or auto or native because uh, you might have the free version that only has that. Uh, but we have that 1920 by 1080. Here's our frame rate, 24 frames per second. And then I restrict the resolution here to 8,000 kilobytes per second. This is the main setting for the quality of your video. If you go too high on this, the file size is going to be really big. But if you go too low, then you will lose out on quality in the video. So usually around 8,000 is decent, I'd say, for a fast video that plays online and you know doesn't have too much of a image quality issue. You could turn this up if you want, but this is, I would say, is a good minimum value to have. Besides that, I leave everything else at the defaults. And once you have that, you say add to render queue, and then you hit render. And would you look at that? It all works just fine. And there you have it, my friends. That is how you make the Chameleon Project. Now, at this point, I bet you might feel a little bit overwhelmed if this is your first time doing CGI, or this might seem like a really daunting, intimidating task. But 
Like anything else, practice makes perfect. You're not going to be comfortable with this stuff within two or three hours or even two or three weeks. It takes time and it takes practice. So what I've done for you guys is I've prepared an ideal set of exercises that you can find at CG Forge. If you haven't done so already, go to cgforge.com, register for free, go to this course, and then only on the course page at CG Forge will you find a download link that'll give you these exercises that reinforce everything we just talked about. When you open up the scene file, you'll find all kinds of descriptions and text in here to help guide you along. In addition, it starts with the foundation exercises where I have a lot of screenshots and a lot of text. These are more of a walkthrough on some of the basic concepts and parts of the interface. Once you get done with that walkthrough, I then have these challenges. And the cool thing about these challenges is that I show you a goal. So for instance, I want you to create this effect where we have a shockwave. And then I try to have you figure this out on your own. Now, I do offer some hints. I do offer some nodes that will assist you in all of this. So again, make sure that you read through some of these helpful tips. But the great thing about this is it really helps you think on your own and think without my help. Because eventually, as a Houdini artist, you want to be thinking for yourself and not completely reliant on tutorials. So the sooner you can engage in this sort of critical thinking and this thinking for yourself, the better. We have a lot of exercises here. So far, I have about, I think, eight, roughly. And again, I have screenshots, all kinds of hints, all kinds of great things to help you uh, along the way with this. So again, go to CG Forge, register if you haven't done so already. It's well worth it and it's completely free. And if you guys feel like studying with me more in the future, then I warmly invite you to join me with Houdini for the New Artist 2, which is going to be the next course in this series. Houdini for the New Artist 2 is for subscribers only or for people that purchase the course at CG Forge. Uh, but if you like my style and you like the way that I teach things, it'll be well worth the price. Thanks for joining me. I hope that this has been very helpful to you. And until next time, have a great day.